We're ready to go. All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to call the meeting in order of the NIAA Border Control meeting this Tuesday, December 7th at, at uh, 9.04 a.m. And, uh, this time, let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And at this time, we'll go ahead and do a roll call. All right. Um, Roland Stallworth. I am here. Pam Sloan. Here. Linda Cavazos. Ron Gerzon. I'm here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Matthew Hyde. Here. Jeff Nevin. Mr. Nevin will be absent. I will comment on that shortly. Okay. Um, Joe Petrie. Here. Joe Rodriguez. Here. Amy Wagner. Here. Okay. Russell Fett. Here. Mike Strong. Here. Bill Darrow. Let's see him. Uh, Ray Parks. Okay. Bob Levitt. Here. Tim Jackson. Here. Brett Walter. Here. Mike Kofer. Okay. Ellen Townsend. Here. Okay. I know Regina will be gone today. Um, Donnie Nelson. Here. Paul Anderson. Here. Jay Beesmeyer. Here. Bart Davis. Here. I am here. Um, Robert Northridge. Present. Okay. And then, right. Mr. Mr. President, I have received a message from uh, liaison Darrow that he will be attending. He is he is just late at this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I uh, I do have an announcement. It's good to see everybody. Um, I can't wait till we get back in person and really start uh, getting our hands and, and feet on the ground and, and working in unison as a as a group together. I know that we are kind of somewhat mastering this Zoom process, but I would rather, of course, uh, be in person. Um, again, if we could get through these items today and uh, and finish up, I think there's a good chance that we won't have to to meet tomorrow. So that will be a, a goal of ours as we go through this. So I know Donnie had some uh, other issues to add to the announcements before I go to the public comment five. Donnie? Yeah, thank you, President Stallworth, and, and thank you, everybody, again, for your dedication to our student-athletes and our association. Uh, board meetings take a lot of time, and certainly, as we all know, there are some uh, big ticket items at, at times, but we're trying to do the best, uh, you know, in, again, on behalf of our student athletes and our membership. I have four, four things to announce. Uh, the, the first one and one uh, B uh, evidently are of sad nature. We lost Leon Reyes uh, a couple days ago, a longtime official and commissioner with the Northeastern Association. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with Leon, certainly those that may be listening here in the public, uh, know, know the name Leon, Leon Reyes, truly a friend, a mentor to so many throughout, not just Northern Nevada, but really throughout the state for all of our officials associations. I think about his communications on a regular basis with the schools in the Eastern part of the state, uh, an outstanding working relationship. And he wasn't just a legend because of all the, the four decades of time that he spent within our membership, but really he earned that uh, respect and trust from so many, so many schools and his ability to communicate and relate with people, the leaders within the school building and also with our coaches and our student athletes, you know, in the competition area. So a huge loss with Leon Reyes. And then one B to that is we also lost Gary Jewett from the Central Association. Again, another long time official, greatly respected within the central part of our state, uh, a, a phenomenal official 
and a, again, a longtime friend and mentor for so many. So to think that we lost um, in this time of seeking officials and trying to get people that we lost two really noble, caring and loving uh, people who had tremendous working relationships with our membership and with our office staff is, is really disappointing. But uh, our, our thoughts and prayers go out certainly to the families of the Reyes family, and the Jewett family. So that's just uh, the negative announcements first, unfortunately. Second announcement is that a reminder, put on your calendars. Our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday, March 22nd and 23rd, respectfully. That will be in person at Boulder City High School. Again, obviously our office staff will make the arrangements for our voting members and our liaisons, but just to make sure you have that on your calendar, Tuesday and Wednesday, March 22nd, 23rd, and looking forward to member Wagner hosting us at Boulder City High School. That'll, that'll be a great experience for all of us. Uh, third, third item is that we have the need to hold a separate meeting with the board to address and hold workshops on a couple of agenda items. Uh, one would be board composition, and that is related to the new board members that will be joining us for adults and students uh, through the Legislative Council Bureau and what's been put towards us. And then the second thing is to address our amateur regulations as they relate to name, image, and likeness. So again, those are two things we did not put on this agenda. Uh, I think we need to have a, a dedicated time to talk about both of those agenda items. And so what I'm proposing that we hold those workshops on Wednesday, January 26th, beginning at 10 a.m. And again, this is not an action item to take this, but I will send this notification out to all of you, again, as, as uh, voting members liaisons, to, to put that on your calendar. I will wait your feedback. And if for some reason that date and that time does not work, then we'll amend it. But to give you a little heads up, again, a board workshop uh, on two things. One is the uh, NACs related to board composition. And the second thing is the NACs related to amateurism. So again, Wednesday, January 26th at 10 o'clock a.m. That will be a Zoom meeting. We will hold that one virtually. So get that, get that ready. The, just if you want to jot down the NACs that we're talking about, first of all, with regards to the board, board composition, that is 385B.106 through 110. So if you want to get a heads up on that, NAC 385B106 through 110. That's the board composition, the role, the membership, the term, uh, the voting members, and the selection and, va of, and vacancies of filling those. So those, those are the items we'll address with regards to board composition. And then the NAC with regards to amateurism is primarily uh, 0.374. And again, we've got to talk about name, image, and likeness with regards to our amateur rules. So again, Wednesday, January 26th at 10 a.m. I'll send that out to you for notification here uh, tomorrow. And the fourth thing, the final thing is I gave you an update on Jeff Nevin from Story County, that is region three. I saw an email from him this morning that he has resigned from the Story County Board of Trustees and therefore effective has resigned from our Board of Patrol. Obviously this just happened. So we will need to go through the process of working with our trustees in the school districts related uh, for, for region three. And as Elko, Esmeralda, obviously doesn't have a high school, Eureka, Humboldt, Lander, Lincoln, Lyon, Mineral, Nye, Pershing, Story, and White Pine. So for, for today, and until we have uh, our friends within NAS help assist us with uh, selecting a new voting member for region three on our board, we will have eight voting members for today. So that's it, Mr. President. Those are the four. Appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we'll go to agenda item five for public comment. This time provides an opportunity for citizens to address the board about any matter not on the agenda. Items raised during this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon until compliance with notice procedures of the open meeting law has been accomplished. Members of the public who wish to speak via the platform for a virtual meeting on this matter, not to sit on the agenda, were instructed to contact Roy Lodge prior to the meeting to obtain the procedure for providing live public comment. Additionally, members of the public who have submitted public comment by email will have their email read into the record. Those in attendance in person who wish to address the board are to fill out a public comment card and submit it to the president prior to the opening of this item. A limit of three minutes per person and or five minutes for a spokesperson of a group may be imposed. It is requested that comments be directed to the board as a whole. Comments that are determined to be irrelevant 
fictitious offenses inflammatory will be disrupted or deemed to be personal attacks will not be permitted. The time limit and restrictions just described will apply to email comments being read into the record as well as live comment. Uh, at this time, um, are there any areas out there that are, are contacting and participating <coughs> this meeting? Have any people of public comment interest at this time? Mr. Stallworth, I do have two people um, for public live public comment. I have um, Mr. Tony Polzian from Foothill High School and Mr. Chris Folf, Bols, excuse me, from the National Sports Consulting Agency. Uh, Mr. Fulce, if you would like to go ahead, please. Good morning, board. I appreciate you uh, allowing me to come in and speak for a couple minutes. My name is Chris Fulce. I'm a basketball official. I've been for 25 plus years. Been out here since 05. Uh, part of SNOA since about 08. I also have my own association uh, to provide sports officials for various private schools, tournaments, and so forth. And reached out to several middle schools, the head of middle schools, Xavier reached out to me and some of the private schools uh, to facilitate providing officials uh, because SNOA, I guess, is shorthanded this year. I spoke to Mark Ratner yesterday. He said, Chris, you know, we know who you are. I've known Mark for many years. I just want to help. And I've got officials that aren't part of SNOA that want to work. So I'm just here to bring knowledge and let you guys know that I'm out here. Uh, I know a lot of you guys probably don't even know who I am. I see a couple familiar faces on there. So some of you do know who I am. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't want to punish the kids anymore. I think they've been through hell, excuse my language, for the last couple of years and pushing anything back as far as sports. Sports are the integral part of kids' lives. And to punish them by not having sports is just, I think it's going to hurt us all. So I just want to take time. Uh, I do have an, my own association. Anything I can do to help SNOA or middle schools or high schools or private schools or charter schools, I'm here to help and uh, make sure we have seasons for these kids. Thank you, Mr. Fulce. Um, and we also have Mr. Tony Polzian from Foothill. Hey, good morning, Director Nelson, and I board of control. Uh, my name is Tony Polzian. I'm an athletic administrator at Foothill High School in Henderson, Nevada. Um, I'm writing um, and I'm speaking out of concern for our student athletes um, in Clark County, specifically um, in regards to the lack of officials in Southern Nevada. Last minute schedule changes, it seems, have become normal. Um, I really, I, I find this hard to comprehend since we are giving our, we get our schedules months in advance. Um, this official shortage has been an issue all year, so I don't understand how we have to find out last minute and then adapt when knowledge of shortage was known months in advance. During the fall season, I, I can only speak for Foothill, but we had student athletes not returning to school on game nights until almost 11 p.m. due to the inability to provide enough officials to use two gyms for volleyball. These late in evenings are causing attendance and academic issues. And additionally, the shortage is requiring staff to spend more time away from their own families and forcing schools to scramble to find coverage in regards to ticketing and security on weekends. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's in the best interest of our student athletes that if they're unable to fulfill the agreement we have that we need to be given the opportunity to find alternate officiating in Southern Nevada. Um, our students and staff have been stretched thin enough. And I understand that these changes in this pandemic has been difficult for everyone but we really have to consider what is in the best interest of our student athletes first and not ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate the comments. Lori, any others? That is all the live public comment I had and I do not have any emails either. No, no further comments at this time. I think we leave us agenda item five and move forward. Thank you very much. On to agenda item six, approval of the agenda for December 7th and 8th, 2021, NIAA board meeting, board of control meeting for possible action. And President Stallworth too, uh, if and when a motion is to be made with this item, uh, ask that it please be flexible. That is important in the way we may approach this agenda today. Thank you. This is Pam Sloan. I'll make the motion that we approve the December 7, 21 agenda. At the same time, I'm also requesting that we have a flexible agenda. 
Okay, we have a motion. This is Amy Wagner. I second that motion. Wagner second. Are there any other questions, discussions, suggestions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. The ayes have it, and we will have a flexible agenda for today's uh, meeting for December 7th of the NIAA Board of Control meeting. Thank you very much. We'll go to item number seven, approval of the minutes for sets from our September 21st, 22nd, 2021 NIAA Board of Control meeting for possible action. This is member Wagner. I vote uh, I, to uh, approve these minutes from the last meeting. This is Pam Sloan, I'll second that. We have a first and second. Any further questions, discussions, or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, and thank you. We have the approval for the minutes from our September 21st, 22nd, 2021 NIAA Board of Control meeting. Thank you very much. And on to agenda item eight, the financial report. For possible action, Mr. Beesmeyer. Good morning, everybody. Um, got to financial stuff pretty quick. <laughs> Keep you on your toes there, Mr. Beesmeyer. Uh, yeah. uh, a little, a little uh, I won't say unprepared, but uh, not, not going to be able to give you um the accurate numbers for what happened this fall that i'm accustomed to being able to do with the onset of hold on one second yeah um as you all know we we used online ticketing this past fall season um i would say it was a huge success in, in um in more ways than one, financially, um, uh, it uh, it surpassed numbers. Uh, I got to unhook my phone. I'm sorry. Hang on. Um, surpassed numbers, um, certainly of recent years when we haven't had sports. But uh, looking back through the history of the NIAA. Uh, we had a, a record fall season. Um, and, and I think uh, that's due to a lot of people's efforts, time and effort, uh, getting kids back out there playing. So uh, everybody, everybody was ready to go watch some high school sports. And, and it showed by the numbers that uh, were accumulated during the fall season for football, volleyball, girls and boys soccer. Um, and our non-revenue sports, cross country, uh, girls golf, tennis, uh, everything uh, was a success in, in the fact that all of our schools stepped up, hosted events, uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, everybody did a great job. Uh, the, the procedures were a little different, but everybody just kind of adapted to the changes that we made. Um, and I believe I pretty much have everybody paid so what shows up in these uh, uh, financial reports, uh, there are some, some missing items, some security, some officials bills not paid. So what you see here in, in our financial reports, it was of December 2nd, a lot has happened since the second even, you know, as far as bills coming in, uh, revenues being uh, recognized. Bart Davis was a, you know, has been a huge help in, in the ticketing process. Uh, so thank you out to Bart. Uh, he, he's amazing in, in, um, in the, what he can do with a, a spreadsheet and, and got everything listed up on the ticketing side of things and worked with hometown ticketing. Uh, that, that's proved to be a great relationship. One going forward, uh, I don't see why it should change. It should continue to be great. Um, and I'm not hearing, you know, much, uh, from, from board members or, or anyone else, our member schools that, you know what, we need to go back to the way things work. Uh, so with that said, let me, let me show you what is in your packet financially. And then we'll talk about some numbers 
um, that happened over the fall um, that, that um, are very encouraging. The balance sheet, as, like I said, on page 26 shows the cash um, in our checking and money market accounts. Um, I, I can just let you know that uh, there's, I haven't received our December bank statement, which is when I recognize all these revenues that came in because that's, that's how they get um, put into our account now. I'm not receiving checks from schools uh, for, for events, et cetera. You know, it was all done online. Uh, we did have schools do cash sales for, for events uh, that totaled uh, a little bit over $50,000. Uh, in cash sales, which shows up in the in a document we'll get to. So our, our checking account has a lot more money than that in it right now um, to reflect all of our fall sport revenues. It's just not reflected in this particular document. Uh, going, going forward on page 27 is a breakdown of the, the QuickBooks profit and loss statement for the NIAA. Um, it's showing football revenue, soccer revenue, volleyball revenue. Um, we can we can kind of get to these, and you can jot these down as notes. Uh, but uh, football, it looks like football is going to do, um, you know, in excess of four hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue. Um, it shows thirty-one thousand there. We did over four hundred thousand dollars in football revenue. Um, and you can look at budgeted figures on what we budgeted, but I'll tell you right now for football, we budgeted 268,000. Um, so that alone is encouraging, uh, soccer. It, it shows on this sheet, uh, the cash sales of 7066. It looks like soccer's, um, going to do over a hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue. Um, when it, when I get everything put in and it'll be next week when I get my bank statement and can reconcile all of the event revenue, but I can certainly give you ballpark figures and, and Bart can add to that as well. Um, girls volleyball, we had $6,000 worth of cash sales, as you can see, um, for a total of 44. So that, you know, I said there was 50,000. There's still some out there. I haven't received checks from schools that did some cash sales volleyball, is, is going to do, you know, over $80,000 worth of revenue. What did we budget for volleyball? We budgeted 66. Uh, soccer, like I said, uh, we budgeted 102. We're going to exceed that number. Uh, not like we are in football. Uh, just uh, an FYI on some, some other figures uh, for football, uh, the Allegiant, Stadium state football event was tremendous. Uh, we had, you know, over 14,000 tickets sold for that event uh, for state football, which is twice as many as we've ever had for, for our state football events, twice as many. Usually I can predict within, you know, a couple hundred people on how many are gonna attend our events. This year, uh, there was no predicting on, on you know, the successes we had attendance wise and, and revenue wise for our fall season. Uh, we were uh, struggling, you know, with a couple years of pandemic and, and relying on PPP funds to keep us afloat. Uh, this fall season has certainly aided our cause as far as uh, strengthening our financial numbers and our, and our budget uh, moving forward. Uh, Still on page 27, other operating income dues revenue, as you can see, 276,000. That's, um, that's everybody has paid their dues. Um, a struggle to get some to do that, but uh, we got it all. Publication revenues is rule book revenue, activity cards, uh, even with all the activity cards that we issued uh, at no charge this year for people that bought them last year, uh, we still have $45,000 worth of revenue. And I believe we didn't budget that much. As you look on page 30, activity card revenue, we budgeted 30,000. Uh, so another good figure there for, for the budget. And on down the line, um, the profit and loss statement, uh, you can look at the expenses and, and 
the one probably worth mentioning most is, you know, what is this ticketing costing us? Um, it, it's costing us about 16% of our revenues. Uh, Bart and I have batted back that figure 15, 16, 17% of our revenues uh, for, for ticketing, uh, which is significant. I mean, it, it's a it's a big chunk of change, but um, you know, to to go to that system, it was going to cost us some money to do it. We raised the prices, obviously. Um, so, you know, probably the biggest factor in our increased revenue is the increased ticket prices. Uh, but uh, you know, for for our fall sports that we we usually have, uh, I think uh, I think I put a worksheet in here on page. Uh, where is it? Oh, I put 2019-20 fall sports worksheet in here on page 46 that showed our paid admissions at 56,000 for our last complete school year uh, on page 46. As you can see down there, 56,000. Um, we sold 65,000 online tickets uh, alone. So that's that's a huge increase. Um, in, in attendance from 56 to 65 online. And then we had our cash sales also that uh, was an additional, I, I believe, get that pulled up real quick. I can tell you uh, attendance figures for our cash sales was an additional 5,900. So we're looking at, you know, over, uh, 71,000 people compared to 56 back in 1920. Nice. Well, you know, just uh, can't say how much we needed that, number one. And, and it's nice to see people heading back out to the games. Uh, so that's the profit and loss statement. Like I said, a lot of this, uh, the, the billing side of this, you can see we've already paid $60,000 in, in officials fees. There's more to come. Uh, tournament expenses are, are pretty much paid, except for the recognition of, of our, our ticketing um, expense, uh, which is significant. It's going to be $100,000 um, for our ticketing expense. But the bottom line is 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 good, and I'll just kind of stop right there and, and ask for any questions on on this fall season. Kind of see if any of you have got something specific you want to discuss about the fall. Um, I'm sorry I can't present the numbers in in total accuracy for the fall season, just because uh, I, I want to make sure if I do, I'm just not throwing them out there and and then have to go back and, and redo them and and you know because I like to be accurate and and uh, with the help of Bart we're gonna you know we'll have it down to to where online ticketing and and trying to get it uh, you know dealing with all the refunds etc which aren't you know amounting to a whole lot um, I know the company that we deal with stripe uh, that releases holds our funds and releases our fund want wants to uh, hold 25% of our net tickets, our, our ticket sales in a reserve fund for four months. They want to hold our money because this type of business um, has shown, you know, and they're a worldwide company they, that they need to reserve our funds in case people uh, want, you know, there's an excessive number of refunds, et cetera, and they want to make sure that we can cover that. I've been battling with them for the past 30 days with the help of hometown ticketing. Uh, we have got them to release all of our funds. They finally released the last 103,000 on, on December 6th that they were holding. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, like I said, with hometown ticketing's help, uh, we were able to show them that our business is, is not going to have an excessive amount of returns, refunds, et cetera. Uh, they first wanted to know, well, what's, what was the big increase in your business due to, I had to supply all these documents to them to let them know that, hey, you know, this is what we do. Um, there won't be an excessive number of refunds, et cetera. Uh, please release our money because uh, we need it, basically is what I told them. <laughs> and they did. 
So um, thanks to Hometown Ticket and Crew, if any of them are on, you know, watching this. Uh, they, they, they were awesome to work with. So I'll be quiet. Any questions on our, our, home, our financial statements currently as of December 2nd? Uh, any of the numbers uh, jump out at you that you want an explanation on? Uh, I could go on and on, obviously, you know, on, on what happened this past fall season, still gathering all that data. Anybody? Well, Jay, we, uh, we definitely appreciate your thorough and, and in-depth uh, explanation of this. And it sure is good to have, have these numbers on the positive side uh, for a change. And, and that's good. Um, as we go through this, remember we're we're trying to um, expedite the meeting in some capacity. Um, we this is an action item. A normal um, meetings we kind of uh, let let people uh, use a day between the meetings to go over these items. Um, usually, a lot of the comments are are based on uh, issues we're having with, with, with a financial deficit. In this particular case, it looks like uh, that, that aspect is limited in some capacities. Are there any questions that anybody would have or any additional comments or suggestions as we move forward? Because this is an action item and I'd like to maybe see if we can get this passed today. Uh, Bart Davis, uh, again, thanks, thanks for all your help. Um, you know, you have a... Uh, a great mind for all of this stuff. And, and, um, you know, you know, I certainly appreciate all the, all the help that you've given me and compiling all this data. I mean, it's, it certainly is a lot, uh, to do at the end. Um, so, you know, the, the workload has shifted from prior to all the events, getting the tickets all sent out and wrapped up and, you know, making them kind of, you know, dummy proof for the people who, you know, hey, I just tried to, like, I would label the tickets day by day, try to make it as easy as possible for all of our schools to host events and, and know what they would have to do for reconciling and, and sending us checks after events. And, you know, with all of that workload uh, not having to be done and, and relying on our schools to just learn the online ticketing process, uh, the numbers that come at you after is, is where, you know, I'm spending most of my time now trying to, to reconcile all of this, uh, to make it add up. I'm a to the penny guy. Um, this online ticketing is, you know, they hometown ticketing has told me they're happy. Uh, if, if they get within 3%, uh, if the numbers that actually get deposited versus, uh, what are sold and refunds, et cetera. If they come within 3% of that number, that's acceptable. Uh, to me, that's not. Uh, I got a couple of guys at Hometown Ticketing and, and gals that are helping me whittle that number down to where right now it's at 0.03%, um, which is acceptable You know, for them. They think it's great. I, I like deposits. I like to be able to add them up and, and put them in the right account and have it, you know, come out to the penny. Uh, but I may have to create like a, an account that, you know what, there's $139 missing that I can't find in this online ticketing thing. And, um, you know, I'm not real happy about that, but uh, I think that's the way it is with, with this and, and the charges and, the percentage fees that get charged and these spreadsheets are immense, you know, as, as you can imagine for the fall season with 65, you know, 70,000 ticket sales, probably 40,000 transactions. Um, you know, it should all add up to me. That's the way I look at it. Um, but um, still working on it and to make it add up. And so I'll do my best in that regard and make sure that we're not having, you know, large sums of money, just kind of floating around in some account that, you know what, I can't figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. Um, but uh, being able to figure it out with, uh, you know, a, a nice fall season behind us is easier to do than uh, struggling and, you know, not meeting our goals, not meeting our budget goals, et cetera. So Bart, thank you. And go ahead, Bart Davis. Uh, you know what, you can probably, um, 
you know, the numbers I mentioned, we, you know, we really haven't discussed. I kind of got thrown for a loop this morning when, when Donnie told me that Leon Reyes had passed away. I'm just kind of, I love that guy. And I'm just kind of upset. Okay, thank you. Um, so much credit needs to go to Hometown Ticketing for all the work that they did. We were able to start selling tickets six, seven days in advance of some events. That helped us as people bought tickets. Some of those people might not necessarily have shown up for the game, right? Because we did have some tickets that, that didn't get checked in. But through Hometown Ticketing, and I know Jay doesn't want to banter about too many numbers until he's got exact but just through hometown ticketing alone, our sales, and again, this is not money that comes back to us because hometown has to take its, its fees out of that that we've discussed at prior board meetings, but we sold better than $600,000 worth of tickets for the fall through hometown ticketing. It's, it's an amazing number. It's a staggering number to have 14,000 people at our state football games, which once we set up Allegiant, the number in my mind was 10. And once I saw how ticket sales were going early in the week, I told Jay, I thought we could get to 14 and people kept coming. And that last game of the day, Moapa Valley and Virgin Valley, an incredible experience for anybody who was there. So it's a great learning experience for all of us. Um, me getting into some of what Jay does also to kind of help him through the technology aspect of it has given me a little bit better a view of, of everything Jay has to do and everything we do as an office, but for all the work that went into everything to see these kind of numbers in front of us, uh, once everybody had a chance to kind of gather them and, and take a breath, it really was a tremendous fall. And, and as Jay said, so many people did so much work to make this happen. And hopefully it's something that's a good sign for us going forward. Hey, thank you very much, Barry. Again, we're looking for a, a motion on this item. Hey, it's Joe Peter. I have a question for you. How much of this revenue do you think is a result of adding the fifth classification for playoffs in states? Because that's additional games. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's you know, I'll be able to, you know, figure out game by game on how many extra football games we played, Joe. Um, I, I don't think, um, you know, for football, um, we usually play 44 football playoff games. Um, we played seven, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 25, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 43, 45, 47. We played 51 games. So um, 51 versus 44, Joe. And I think that that probably gives you a good idea of, of you know, whatever that is, seven into four. Seven into forty-four. Sure. That's uh, sixteen percent more games, and I would think that that held true throughout soccer and volleyball. Okay. So, um, Joe, looking at the data, if I can kind of help Jay with this too, um, I think there were three factors in this. One, as you mentioned, the increase in classes, so number of games. Obviously, that's also an increase in expense. The increased ticket prices. Also, and not just the $2 on adults, but remember, we didn't have a senior ticket price. So that was a little bit of an impact as well for seniors that were used to paying a reduced amount. And then the third thing is, I think we tried to go to more host sites when we could for playoff games, as opposed to having a, a, a neutral site semifinals, we went to host sites and that helps with the attendance a little bit as well when we looked at those numbers. So I, those were the three biggest factors. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good number for us to look at too, Joe. As far as that goes, is the attendance figures, uh, which have not fluctuated at all over the years. I mean, they're they're so consistent from year to year. So you know, we we can look at our 1920 year, which was um, the last year that we had all sports, right? 
I'm losing track of my COVID yep. calendar, but yep. Um, 1920 and, and, and those kind of, you know, attendance figures, we were at 50. So you had 16% to that. And so, yeah, we we're exceeding, uh, even with those percentage increases, uh, and I think online ticketing helped us in that regard. Um, you know, no disrespect to any of our schools who were selling tickets and then it's just a more, an easier process. You either have a ticket or you don't when you're at, when you're at the gate and getting scanned in. And I think that, uh, solved a lot of problems you know, for our gate people. Anyway, I am also in responsible for keeping the NASC books and, and those those numbers are on page 32 and 33 of your packet. Uh, NASC is is looking good. They're finally starting to hold events and I'm getting requests from our our region leaders uh, for NASC for for monies for for conferences and stuff like that. But they you know they have $170,000 plus in their checking account. And I know that a lot of you will remember, you know, they were struggling at the twenty, thirty thousand dollar number, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago. And um, anyway, they need to spend some of their money and have more conferences. Uh, but they're they're in good financial shape. All right. Well, thank you again. We're looking for a motion. Joe Petra, all motion to accept the financials as presented. This Thank is you, Joe. We have a motion. Is there a second? This is Pam. I'll second. We have a second. Any further questions or discussion? Um, I have one, and that is uh, Jay, when you have that updated um, and, and stuff with that new information coming in in September. Uh, will, will the board member be sent that information or will we have to wait till the next board meeting? Um, it's, it's up to you. I can, I would feel, I would feel like, you know what, you need to know what happened in the fall before we get to a March meeting. So I, I would uh, compile that information and send you out of you know, all board members a short report on where we ended up for the fall. Well, that would be great. I'd appreciate that. I think the other board members will too. Yeah. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we will go to agenda item nine, lifetime pass request for possible action. Donnie? Yep, page 47. You see the two names that have been submitted. Uh, both are approved through our office as presented in accordance with our regulations 385B.862. Penny Otteson and Terry Rice, two outstanding individuals, great uh, proponents for our association. That said, Mr. Uh, Stallworth, we'll look for a motion. That's great, looking for a motion. This is Pam, I'll make the motion that we accept the uh, lifetime passes for Penny and Terry. Joe Petrie, I will second. Thank you, we have a first and second. Any further questions or discussions? Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The ayes have it. Congratulations to those two. Um, in reference to our flexible agenda, we are going to go to agenda item 14 at this particular time. And we will stay the course until we make another change a little bit later. So at uh, this particular time, we're going to go to uh, page four of the agenda. Uh, item number 14, new membership applications for the 22-23 school year for possible action. It's going to be on page 81 of your packet. And the board will consider these new membership applications. Donnie. Yes, President Stoller, thank you very much, everybody. We have three, and that will be presenting today. I am going to respectfully turn it over to Ms. Lotz from our office staff. She is going to coordinate the presentations of these three, and we'll explain the page numbers that are involved in the packet uh, for each of these presentations. Again, this is for new memberships, and again, you see three on there, Amplus Academy, Encompass Academy, and American Heritage Academy. Uh, Ms. Lotz, if you would, please, I will let you direct 
uh, our presenters accordingly. Thank you. All right, we do have the three members and we have Mr. Tyrell Cooper from Amplus Academy. We will have you go first. Hi, um, I have a presentation to share. If you can let me share my screen real quick. Sure. You should be and able to share now. Yep, and Mr. Cooper, if you would introduce yourself, please, and uh, a quick, quick, brief history of you with the school, and then I'll we'll let you take it from there as you get going. Thank you. Gotcha. Uh, my name is Tyrell Cooper. Um, I am the athletic director at Amplus Academy. Um, this is my second year here. Um, previous to that, I was in CCSD for the last uh, 19 years or so before that. Um, my computer is actually not allowing me to share, so I will run through it with you guys real quick. Um, without sharing it. So AMPLUS is a uh, tuition-free public charter school. It opened in the fall of 2019 before um, AMPLUS Academy was in our building. A uh, school by the name of American Preparatory Academy operated out of this building. We've retained about a third of the staff members from American Preparatory Academy and about half of the students from that school. Um, but since we've become AMPLUS Academy, we've grown significantly um, with almost 800 more kids, 60 more students, We've added a second building, um, an elementary school building on there. We do not offer any specific programming uh, like STEM or performing arts to recruit students. We offer a traditional well-rounded education model that focuses on character development. Um, providing athletic opportunities for our kids is a pretty big part of that component. And we're looking forward to full membership um, at some point with the NIAA. So that way we can continue using athletics to build good people. Um, our enrollment numbers, currently this year, we have 496 high school kids. We project to be between 525 and 550 next year um, with slight to steady increases. Uh, I think if we maxed out every seat that we could have, uh, we would have about 800 high school kids um, at, a full, at full capacity, but I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there. We currently offer uh, volleyball in the fall along with boys and girls cross country flag football in the winter, along with boys and girls basketball, and then volleyball in the spring, along with men's and women's track and field. We've been able to schedule full schedules in all of our sports. Um, we do our best to take advantage of the permission to play plus one that the NIAA has in place so we can schedule teams that may already have their 18 game limit met. Uh, in volleyball this fall, we played 15 games uh, plus two tournaments. Our basketball teams um, both have boys have 18 games in a tournament. Girls have 17 games in a tournament and our winter flag football program. Uh, the girls have 11 games scheduled. I got a call yesterday. We may bump that up to 12 uh, by the end of the day today. Our roster sizes are pretty normal and standard from a charter school standpoint, as I've learned more and more about charter schools. Um, our girls sports were a little bit smaller um, than our boys sports, but I mean, our student population reflects that. But we've had, uh, you know, 20 to 30 girls in volleyball, a total of 21 kids in cross country this year. We have 17 girls out for flag football this year, 25 boys basketball players. So our, our numbers have been growing from last year, which was a unique year anyway, um, to this year. Facilities, we have a um, K-12 building with full-size basketball court that can operate volleyball on it, can also flip and run volleyball, two courts going sideways. Our elementary school has a little bit smaller of a basketball court. It's a six feet narrower than a high school court, but still the same length. But we can offer a full-size volleyball at our elementary school. Um, we have a little practice field at our elementary school our flag football team uses. We are near uh, three different CCSD high schools. Um, and we currently rent the flag football field at Spring Valley High School for our girls to practice at. We have a, our own field. Uh, an, athletic uh, expansion in the permitting process, uh, which is taking longer than I would like it to, but I mean, everything's taking longer than I would like it to with that. Um, that will have a soccer field with a flag football on it, um, stadium lights, small sets of bleachers, uh, scoreboard concession stands, bathrooms, and we'll also include a building where we can put a weight room in at. Um, from a future growth standpoint, once we get uh, the soccer field built, we'll add men's and women's soccer as fall sports. We have a lot of interest in boys and girls soccer from all of our school, all of our kids here. Um, we've had very good numbers in youth bowling, uh, elementary and middle school bowling right now. 
So we plan to add that sometime in the near future, but uh, we're real cautious. We don't want to overextend our athletic offering beyond what our facility can handle and what our enrollment numbers can support. Uh, we really don't want to be the school that's having to cancel multiple levels and cancel entire seasons and programs as we go. But our youth sports, you know, every sport that we offer at the high school level, we also offer at the elementary and middle school level. And on top of our about 500 high school kids, we have almost 2000 kids in our K through eight program. And uh, that honestly keeps me pretty busy throughout the day. I and mean, we have 10 elementary and middle school basketball teams going this this winter uh, as we you know build those programs. So we have a good little feeder system built in house to handle that. And I mean, at this time, I can answer any questions you guys have. We're, we're really looking forward to taking this next step in our, in our process towards full membership. Hey, Bob Northridge here, uh, staff. Uh, I can just say I've known Tyrell for the last probably 15 years. He has been so instrumental in uh, the regional and state cross country meet, which in the Stouts regional and state track uh, at all levels. Uh, he took the athletic director's job at Amplus, I knew he would be just awesome, and he is. I've done three site visits over to Amplus, and he's got his stuff together. Everything is going in the right direction at Amplus. I can tell you that right now. Thank you, Robbie. Hey, this is Tim. Um, I can tell you that Tyrell is on top of his schedules. Matter of fact, he's on them more than I am. And he can tell you who he needs to play, who his plus ones are. Uh, he fills his schedule. We have not had, and Tyrell, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you've had a cancellation of any game you've scheduled. Other teams have canceled on you, but you have not canceled on anyone else that I'm aware of. I could have missed one or two. But uh, likewise, his communication with the other schools is phenomenal. Uh, his reputation precedes him. We are all aware of what he did when he was at Coronado and we're happy he's over there and Tyrell's done a great job and I look forward to working with him and looking forward to the day he's hosting uh, regional meets at his campus and regional soccer when that field is built. <laughs> we will, we will be happy to host. I mean, and as part of that, I know that many charter schools um, do not have full facilities. I mean, it's, it's as we go to games, uh, you know, we joke, but it's entirely true that, you know, people in sports and education don't build charter schools, philanthropists do. So there's a lot of facility issues within charter schools. And, and we're working our best over here to kind of mitigate those issues that we have. Um, and I've fully inserted myself into the construction of our soccer field here. And we would be glad to host everything that we can when the time comes. Hey, Tyrell, this is Pam. Good to see you, by the way. And I agree with everything in which uh, Tim has said, as well as Bobby, he's amazing. He's a, he's a great gentleman. In regards to the sport of flag football, are you hosting, I know you're practicing at Spring Valley. Are you hosting any home events? And if so, where are those being played? We are not. Um, our, all 11 of our games are currently scheduled away. Um, we had looked into renting uh, a facility to host at, like, we could rent uh, Spring Valley High School's field to host a game at. Um, but every game that we scheduled was away and we didn't have anybody really press us that we needed to host. Um, so we have not yet. It is something that we looked into uh, doing, but this year we haven't needed to. So everybody we've, that we're playing has a field, but it's an option. I talked to Coach P uh, at Spring Valley High School and he said it wouldn't be an issue. I mean, we have the paperwork in. For, from a practice standpoint with CCSD to host up there. Um, and I making an amendment to that to add, make that games wouldn't be an issue at all. We, we try to offset that. I mean, we try to over host in volleyball and flag foot or volleyball and, and basketball, just so that way, um, cause I know we can't host in uh, flag football. I even last year managed to somehow host two cross country meets here on our one square block of campus. And I do know, and I think the board members need to be reminded that you're not coming, you're just asking to be a member and you'll still be on independent status, correct? And that's, Lori, if that, that's my understanding of all three schools. Yes, if they're approved, they will become associate members and they'll be on independent status for the minimum of two, two years okay. to make sure they can field their teams and their sports. And to add to that too is what some, something Tyrell said, facilities is huge. We have had schools that came to the board and said, hey, listen, 
I want to, we want to do baseball softball, but we don't have a facility yet. Well, that that's a nightmare when it comes to Tim Jackson and having to put a schedule together. So really those of you that are coming forth or those that are listening that want to be a part, facilities is huge. Another thing too, before we proceed, I'd also like to say that I would really like to see schools coming aboard with team sports as opposed to individuals. You know, it's it's tough when we have schools that come forth and they have like in the in the fall, they have cross country. We have two boys, two girls. That really hurts in the long run as we go forward and it really impacts the 3A. Um, we can have that discussion later, but I would really like new schools to come aboard with team programs, basketball, volleyball, softball, so on and so forth. And, and the consistency of establishing these programs. Don't just have a bowling one year and then say, oh, nope, we're not gonna do it this year. We're gonna have cross country. So we're also looking for that consistency. So that's just, I just wanted to add that for the conversation for all schools that will be speaking today. Yeah, th again, just Donnie Nelson from the staff. Uh, thank you to Mr. Northridge, Mr. Jackson, Ms. Sloan for your comments. Right on cue uh, with everything that was discussed for the last three. I will tell you that uh, Amplus Academy is, is exceeding requirements for membership. They are progressing properly. And really, this has become a, a model for a new membership venture. So thank you to Mr. Cooper on that. President Stallworth, sure, I'll turn it over to you. Good, at this time, so we need it, uh, since this is an action item. Um, yes. Mr. Stallworth, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do we wanna hear all the presentations first and then take care of the uh, motions? One at a time. Yeah, I think the, this is Donnie Nelson, the staff. I'm gonna say the recommendation from legal counsels to go one by one. Mr. Uh, Mr. Stallworth. Thank you. I agree. One by one at this particular time. So we're only talking about uh, and plus Academy at this particular time. So uh, is there a flavor for a motion? Oh, so we're going to do them independently. If that's the case, I will make a motion to accept Amplis as a new member. This is Ron Gerzana. I'll second that motion. We have a first and a second. Are there any further questions or discussions? I would like to uh, thank Pam for making that motion. This is a, I believe a Clark County uh, situation and Southern Nevada situation as, as usual in these cases. Uh, and I appreciate their, uh, their input in, in um, this discussion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The eyes have it. Thank you very much. And welcome aboard, Mr. Academy. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it and look forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Next, we have on the agenda uh, for uh, new membership applications. In Encompass. Encompass. That's Encompass correct. Mr. Academy. And ladies. 108. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, beginning on page, page 108 will be the application. And... Uh, uh, Ms. Lotz, I will turn it back over to you to coordinate for us, please. Thank you. Okay. From um, Encompass, we have um, Toby, who is the administrator, and I believe Tish, who's their new athletic director. Um, ladies, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I do also have a presentation if you want to, but I can just talk through as well. Um, the history of Encompass Academy is we actually were formerly Rain Shadow opened in 2003. We underwent uh, a transition in 2016 and relocated to the Boys and Girls Club um, that is on the Foster Drive location across from Reno High School in Reno. Um, since making that relocation, we felt that we had a, an amazing facility and a great opportunity to provide the opportunity for our students to engage in athletics. And in many situations, many of our students would not necessarily have gone after their zone school to, to have that participation. So from where we sit right now, we feel like we're in a transition phase 
of trying to build up um, opportunities for our students and engagement around those athletic opportunities, which is a little bit of a transition because, as I said, we've been around since 2003. And um, as such, you know, there, we've never had athletics before. So this is a big, a big change. Um, so for your knowledge of our enrollment, we have 110 students currently. We would max in this facility at about 160 students. Um, and as you can see, our enrollment by grade levels, um, we often will start a little smaller at freshman because we do not have an, any natural feeder besides being um, within the Boys and Girls Club. So students often are choosing to come here out of other charter schools or after maybe um, struggling at their zone schools. Um, so uh, the goal, again, is our goal as Encompass is to basically help the whole student and reach graduation. In this past year, we looked to offer boys and girls cross country, but we were a little late to the game. And so the promotion of that sport did not necessarily go as well as we had hoped, but we're still looking to do it for next year. We were awful, uh, um, able to offer girls volleyball. We did have eight games played um, and eight student athletes that participated. Um, and then now we are currently working to participate in both men's and women's basketball and we have a 10 game schedule this year um, and then finally in the spring we're looking at offering track and field and softball um, as you'll notice our our membership for the boys basketball team is 13 and our girls basketball team is eight um, we are playing and getting games with most of those schools within the 1a division up here um, and have already been able to play one girls basketball team we recognize that it's going to take us a while to build up our programs, but we do feel fortunate because like I said, we have the facility within the Boys and Girls Club, which is a very nice gymnasium that we have access to. In addition, we are across the street from Reno High School. And finally, we have already spoken with Idlewild Park about using their softball fields and other fields in the springtime. And, and we've got the green light for all of that as well. So we feel very fortunate in terms of facilities. It's just now building the programs um, and, and starting to get more engagement with our students here. Um, so if you have any questions, um, I'm happy or uh, Tisha is also happy to answer any. As we said, we did bring Tisha on to be our athletic director to help to make this a, a more seamless transition moving forward. Hey, Toby, Bob Northridge uh, staff, a uh, couple questions. So uh, you said you're at the Boys and Girls Club. Do you share that facility with the Boys and Girls Club or do you have that facility all to yourselves? So the facility, we lease the Boys and Girls Club facility for our school. So our students actually come to this facility for school. Um, and within that, so the gymnasium is used every day for our PE classes and, and such. I will say we have to coordinate with the club for outside school day times, but we have been working very closely with them to kind of um, both establish practice schedules and then when the gym facility is available to do games. Right. Well, one of the concerns we have had with, um, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. One of the concerns uh, we've had with people that have rented uh, we'll use a YMCA as an example, um, that during the game times that those locker rooms and those facilities are exclusively for the participating teams that while mm -hmm. I, I, I'll give the example at the YMCA, a team came in at halftime to give their halftime speech and there were men in the shower showering and could walk naked and it just wasn't a good situation. You know, it's our concern that what, when you have that for your game days, for you and your opponent, those are exclusively for those schools and, and uh, limited to uh, public access during those game times. Absolutely. And it's one of the things that we've had to work through because if you've ever been in this facility, there's not, um, I mean, it wasn't built to be a school initially. Obviously, it was built in 2014, so it's a very nice facility, very clean However, um, we will be using probably classroom spaces for changing and, and closing off sections of the building, which we'll be able to do because there's not proper locker rooms as such. There's just larger bathrooms. So that's something that we're going to have to work through for sure. Uh, 
Um, Mike Strong here, Prime Valley. Can I ask a question? Um, concerning those facilities as well, that, that's a little of an issue that, that you might have planned in the 1A or 2A, actually, because your numbers would actually put you in the 2A as you would, as you would come in. Obviously, as an associate, you could schedule, you know, continue to schedule 1A schools if they chose to. But the problem gets to be is without showers, you got people traveling a long way on buses. Mm -hmm. And then there's nowhere to shower or anything like that. And we're going to put them on buses and send them back home. So just some things um, to think about as, uh, as you begin to move forward and, and, and plan to be a, be a participant. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, President Stahl, if you want to direct us towards any other questions or comments from board members or liaisons at this point. Yeah, again, like always, I appreciate the, uh, the comments made. Um, uh, at this particular time now, we are looking for a motion for uh, Encompass Academy. Rollins, before we proceed, may I ask a question? Sure. All right, I would... Good, good morning. Uh, I would just like to talk about your spring sports right now. It looks like boys and girls track and field. Um, did you participate in track last spring? No, we did not. In fact, we just started this year, like literally the start of this fall. Um, so that's kind of where that is at this time. Yeah. So we're really still in that beginning phase. Okay. So prior to this, this submission of membership, did you submit an application for per permission to play or you're just starting out the gate with a new membership? We're just starting with a new membership this year. Yep. And okay. we had put in an application last year in the spring, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. Participate. Okay. And, so you, um, you're also just, looking to participate in softball, but at this time you don't, you're not locked into a facility? No, we have a facility. It'll be at Idle Wilds Park we have the access to using the softball fields at Idle Wild Park, which is in with, within walking distance of our building. Okay. Hey Pam, they currently have permission to play schools for this school year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would just like to hear from the Northern uh, Two Way because that's the league in which they will eventually end up in at this time. So um, I know Mike touch, touched on that a little bit. So, okay, I'm good. Hey, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear, uh, I know Bill Darrow wouldn't hear yet, is he? Donnie? Uh, no, Mr. Rockins, I have, I've not seen Mr. I have not seen Mr. Darrow. Um, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, here. Here. Okay. okay. Here. No, hey, thank you. Bill, did you get to hear that presentation? Yeah, I listened. Uh, can I have your thoughts, please, on that? Since they would be coming as a two-way member. Well, it's the same. It's the same thing we've been talking about for a while now. What we talked about in the, the realignment meeting a week or so ago, with. Schools coming in not having, you know, a full, not having enough team sports, not having, you know, the ability to, to fill in on schedules makes it difficult, you know, in that situation. I, I, I don't think it's difficult when they're playing independent and they're, they're choosing to let, you know, the schools play. But coming in as a full member without, you know, the sports – in the three seasons, at least of varsity sports, you know, most of us don't have. A lot of us have trouble with JV sports, but it's difficult and it's not supported, you know, at our, at our level. And and everyone, uh, Lori, Lori, and I can speak to their site visits. This, this is kind of an interesting situation. Um, in visiting with, with Toby and going through it, their facilities have potential for sure, mm -hmm. including softball at Idaho Wild Park and obviously the gym within uh, the club and, and the building in which they're housed. And again, th this is not for full membership. This is for associate membership uh, to put them on independent status. And it's almost one of those situations where 
they need encompass needs the opportunity to be on the status to see if it really can work. Uh, mm-hmm. I believe it can. I believe the the school staff has a structure in place as to how they would handle a home contest and how it would be facilitated. So, and again, again, it may be that at some point when this comes back to the board, if it does at some point, full membership, then things can be evaluated then. Um, Ms. Lotz, I know you've been from our staff, obviously in communication with, with Toby and staff. I'll let me have you jump in and see if there's anything else you'd like to add to, that, to my comments. Uh, yeah, their site definitely has potential. And I can say, as with the other two schools coming um, seeking associate membership status, that they're very responsive. They're not afraid to ask questions. Um, so yeah, they've reached out for anything when they've had a question. When we ask them for something, they're all on it and making sure that we have the information. And so I think that speaks volumes to um, what they're trying to do. It's associate member for independent status for two years. Yeah. Minimum two years. Yeah. And I think this process of associate membership it gives us, uh, again, two more years to evaluate uh, the process and, and, and how they're um, fulfilling their requirement and actually growing as a, as a program as, uh, as they get to participate in a certain amount of sports. Um, at this particular time, we are looking for a motion. Correct. Rollins, Mr. President, Bob Levitt, 5A North Liaison, um, for the record. Uh, just a, a quick question for Toby. Um, Toby, I, I don't know you. I'm formerly the athletic administrator across the street at Reno High School and was there for seven years in charge of athletics and, and facility rental. Um, do you have a commitment? Two questions for you. Do you have a commitment from Reno High um, for use of the track and field um, that would be a concurrent season with their programs that, that would be practicing in that facility. Um, have you spoken with anybody over there? Do you have a commitment from them to use that facility with respect to track and field and uh, cross country is not big of it as big of an issue, but still it's somewhat the same facility. Um, right. And then so, number, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, initially, we had spoken with the athletic director last spring when we first put this application together. Um, there are some changes over at Reno High that happened this year. So now we're, we're, we're working to readjust. So the initial person that I spoke to felt like we would be able to create that kind of relationship. But moving forward, we've got some new individuals that we're working with now. Um, but we have some other ideas on the table as well and some other connections that we have within the community to, to make track and fields viable for us, um, including looking to the university as well. So we're gonna be um, looking for that opportunity. We definitely nailed down. We do have some space behind the, the building to be able to use and we have nailed down Idlewild, but obviously to do actual home meets for track and field, we're gonna need to have access to a place to do that. And that's a, um, what we're working on right now. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. It, it does, and then and and again, I'm I'm not a non-voting member. I'm just a liaison, and and just um, bringing up these points as the person who formerly would have been the person that you would have been working with yeah. on that at Reno High School. Yeah. I, I just know what that situation is. The other thing is, right. are you aware of? And I just reached out to Mr. Hackbush, the principal at Reno High. Um, is the Boys and Girls Club? I know Reno in the past has used the Boys and Girls Club quite significantly for gym space time for basketball. Are you aware on whether or not the, the boys or girls basketball teams from Reno High at this point, lower levels or anything, are using any space at the Boys and Girls Club in their arrangement? Because I know they do a lot of things with the Boys and Girls Club. I know that they will use the space occasionally, but once we're on the schedule, we have set times that we have access to the gym. Uh, because of the lease that we have and because of our relationship with the club, if once I've spoken with those members that are in charge of the club and they put us on the calendar, that time is set in stone. Obviously, we are, you know, a community member as well. So we try to help out where we can sure. with Rehi. So, for example, on smoke days when they have their boys football team meeting space, we've been able to allow that to happen even you know compromising some of our stuff within the school but we work together with all the groups because obviously we're all in this together to kind of support student athletes and make sure that we're all getting better as as, um, 
as programs go. So um, I don't see, they're not using it for basketball now. I know sometimes the big time that that would happen is when we hit playoff time and they're looking for gym space for say, um, we've seen them come in when they're bringing in outside uh, teams that need a place to, to practice before playoffs and things like that. And that's been the, the main thing we've seen with basketball. And it's usually during the school day. So. Okay, great. Thanks for that information, Toby. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Good luck to you. Thank you. You can. Yeah. Okay, this time, is there a motion for a, uh, the approval? Uh, Donnie, I got a question um, for a motion might get made there. So without associate membership, how are they even able to participate? Is there like an allowance to participate right now? Is that what's given? Because I would think with associate membership, as long as you understand the independent status, that is where we would want teams to go until we could get them to a certain spot to, to join whatever particular, particular league they should be in. Um, as long as the understanding of any independent status is there. Um, so that's just kind of the question that I had and thought. Uh, yes, thank you, Liaison Strong. Good night, Nelson, from the staff. Right, with their, the, the status of permission to play could still be granted in our office, uh, but that is where we're to the point about making a motion uh, to get, gain associate membership status. If people feel like it's worthy to see how things go for a minimum of two years to see if they can really find their way towards full membership status. I hope, hope that answers your question, sir. Mr. Strong, I'll add to that that when they submitted their application, um, Mr. Thompson was still our executive director and they were given permission to play and um, through this school year um, well, with the understanding that their application would be heard for associate member um, this, at this meeting. Thank you. Excuse me, this is Bill Darrow, Class 2A. I want to clarify if I can, you know, in my comments. My comments were meant you know, when I said not supported, not supported for full membership coming into to the league without teams. I don't think anybody in the 2A would, would be against allowing the school, you know, an associate membership, independent status, and, and the ability to prove themselves, you know, to see what they can do later. But when it comes time to that full membership, that's when the issues occur if the sports aren't there. So that's, that's I just want to clarify that. And I just want to say, this is Pam, I want to thank Bill Darrell for that comment. And as a result of that, I would like to accept Encompass Academy as a new member of the NIAA. Thank you, Pam. And do we have a second? This is Matt Hyde and I will second it. Thank you very much. We have a first and a second. Any additional comments or suggestions? Um, I would like to make one. It, it, it definitely provides uh, them with a, a wonderful opportunity to get their feet wet in the in the conference play and league play and, and see what kind of games we have. I know up in the north we don't have very many 1A, 2A uh, schools, um, so it would be nice to get some of those up here. Um, I wish them the best of luck, and at this particular time, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. I welcome and compass it. I would appreciate your uh, application. Look forward to some success. Athletics. Thank you very much. And we'll move to um, American Heritage Academy. Begin on page 121, please. Laura? Right. Yes, and we have Miss uh, Brittany Ruiz is here. Um, she is serving as the athletic director and she will be presenting. Are you able to hear us now? Yes, ma'am. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Um, may I share my screen for just a moment? All right. My volume okay? Yes. Great. You're good. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, first, let me say thank you to all the people at NIAA that have kind of helped guide us through this last year process. It's a bit of a minefield when you're trying to navigate all the paperwork, and I we, we definitely would not be here without everybody's help. Um, American Heritage Academy is a private religious school that's been in existence for 27 years. 
In that time, we've grown from 50 students to nearly 700 in grades kindergarten through 12, with a current enrollment of 158 high school students. Our current plan allows us to increase our high school enrollment to 240 by 2023, 2024. Over the years, we've worked hard to develop an athletics program that serves our students and families while maintaining high academic and sportsmanship standards. We participated in different leagues over the years. Uh, most recently, the NCSSA made up primarily of charter schools. However, in the last couple of years, we've set our sights on doing the necessary work to become NIAA members. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to improve and build new facilities, as well as increase our athletic offerings. Over the past year specifically, we've been competing on a permission to play basis and have made sure to follow all NIA standards and procedures set forth. And we've done our best to fulfill all scheduling obligations and have not had to cancel any games or meets. Um, this year, you can see we've offered JV and varsity women's volleyball, uh, men's and women's cross country, and currently have a men's basketball team competing. Unfortunately, we did not have the numbers to field the women's basketball team this year, but I anticipate that changing next year as we move 68th graders into our freshman high school class, as we have a robust middle school athletics program. Um, in, the, in the spring, we anticipate having men's and women's track. Looking towards the future, we anticipate growing our sports as we grow our enrollment, adding women's basketball, as well, in men's, as, well as men's and women's soccer. Um, we do have a goal of adding men's volleyball in the spring, but being completely realistic, that is probably two to three years away. For facilities, we have six full-size volleyball and basketball courts, as well as a full-size soccer field. Uh, the plans have been approved, and we are in the process of pulling permits to add outdoor restrooms and changing facilities adjacent to our field. We do understand that we are not ready to become full NIAA members. However, we are making concerted effort to grow our offerings and add new sports each year. Our administration's fully on board and behind us. Um, I really do feel that the ability to compete against other member schools is essential to our journey, especially when it comes to retaining our student athletes. Um, with that, I ask that you allow us to continue our participation towards membership in the most appropriate status as we grow, as we work to grow and satisfy the requirements that a full membership would require. Thank you so much. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Hey, Bob Northridge staff here. I've been there over the last 10 years, probably two to three times, and the improvements you guys have made. Uh, Mr. Nelson and I went down there a couple months ago. I mean, your basketball facilities are the nicest in the state. I, I can't imagine anybody having six full court basketball games being played at one time in, in one, uh, one facility. Uh, your new soccer field in the back is beautiful. And, um, I can just say I, I can see you guys going in the right spot. And, it, and as far as facility-wise, um, second to none. And I can say, Brittany, um, you reach out to me on a weekly, every other day basis, and I love that, you know, with questions. And that's really good to do that when you have questions. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate you. Hey, this is Pam. Um, my question to you is for the winter sport. Right now, I see that you only have boys basketball. Yes, ma'am. Are you looking to bring forth a female sport? Yes. Yeah. This year, we unfortunately, we attempted to field the women's basketball team. I didn't have the numbers to do that. Um, I do anticipate have, we will have a seventh and eighth grade women's basketball team this year, and we have a lot of numbers there. So as we move those 68th graders up into the high school, um, I foresee next winter being able to fill a women's basketball team. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Cause re realize this, that as you go forward and when, when it's time that you come forth in front of this board, you want full membership. Yes, ma'am. You have to have a representation for male and female. Absolutely. And again, I, yeah. And again, I, I'm going to go back to please build up your team sports. Um, I see that you had four cross country participants on your boys cross country team. Um, would really like those numbers to, to go up and yes, I'm talking from the scheduling side yep. of the house and you do know that your numbers right now with the double multiplier is a two A status, but as you said, with your enrollment going up, you could easily be in the three A when you come forth and apply for full membership. Yes. Just so you can kind of see the trajectory of where our admissions is going. Um, we have the ability to have up to 240. Uh, the thought process behind our administration is, um, we have 60 freshmen, those will move into be a sophomores. We'll then have 60 new freshmen and moving up and through. 
So the goal is 60 students per grade. We have the applications. We just did not have um, all of the staff and facilities in place at the beginning of the school year to accommodate. Okay, when you, what other, one last question. When you transition to the spring season, I see that you, you would like to participate in the, for boys and girls track. Again, I'm going back to my initial conversation. I'd rather see team sports. You and me both, uh, yes ma'am. Did you participate last spring? No ma'am, we did not, we did not have athletics last spring. Okay, so and right it, now it's just a shot in the dark as to how many participants you're going to have for boys and girls track. Yes, we've held some initial meetings as far as to gauge interest and my coaches have started the um, certification processes to make sure that they're ready to be certified coaches when that time comes. Um, but we have not obviously held any sort of official tryouts yet. Um, and yes, uh, the goal is team sports, particularly I was a NIAA high school basketball player down here in the South. That's the sport I coach. It's heartbreaking not to have a women's basketball team this year, to be quite honest. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll be honest with you. I know sometimes I come across real hard on schools that come forth like this, but man, I have a lot of respect for you guys starting from the ground up. I really do. So I appreciate you. And the truth is we're like, like the other schools here, um, we're looking for, you know, minimum two years to prove um, that we are prepared to be full members. We know full well that two years down the road, we still may not quite be there, although that's our goal. Um, but it's really like you had mentioned before, a proving ground. Hey, Roland, Ray Parks, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm the 3A liaison of my southern counterparts. I tend to bring this up as well. I apologize. I had all kinds of issues here on the principal of Lowry High School as well this morning, so I apologize for just chiming in late. But, Pam, as you know, we've in our discussions with the realignment committee, our concern always is that they come into the 3A, you have a cross-country team, boy and girl, and then it turns out to be the same boy and girl on the track and field. And when you come into the 3A, they have all kinds of trouble um, scheduling because now you're really not a full participant, yet you're one of the 3A members. Um, anyway, your thoughts on that? And I realize that, you know, I don't know the school and I don't know it as intimately as Mr. Northrup does, but um, they always want me to bring this up as the 3A liaison. No, that's entirely fair. Um, please, if you would be so kind as to remind me the, the cap of students permitted where the kind of the break from 2A to 3A goes. Well, I can give you the break on it, but we're not really following any of that anymore. It, they do competitive balance in the South, especially with the rubric. So you get, you know, you get the double multiplier and so I, on, but I don't know if I would say that's a hard and fast rule anymore. Would you, Pam? Pam, well, you want me to jump in here? Yeah, Ray, if, they're, if, they're, um, if their enrollment protected, it is a hard and fast rule. The enrollment protected schools stay in the 3A. So we have the, uh, the enrollment protected schools first, then we fill in with the rubric, whichever is left, based on the cap of the number of teams we're allowing into the 3A. Sure, but the only enrollment protected ones are the original Moapa Valley, Boulder City, Virgin Valley, and I, I think Pahrump, but maybe not Pahrump anymore. Um, I would say, Donnie, I think there's actually some of the double multipliers are in there as protected as well, correct? I don't think so. You know what? That's, that's a, no, a great question, everybody. I have to get out my Yes, Ms. My Mr. House. Nelson, I'll jump in. That is yeah, correct. We do right. have some charters that are enrollment protected as a part of that 3A right now. But that would be the original ones, Bart, from way no, back. Not, no, sir. Not any, yeah. Oh, boy, unless we've changed some things. Anyway, I'll shut up, but they want me to mention that. So I'd like that to be. Sure. I had been told throughout the last year of this process that based on our, our numbers for the next two years, we would sit uh, squarely in 2A. If that is not the case, then obviously I apologize. I was misinformed. Well, I'll just tell you right now with the double multiplier for you to be in class 3A, it's 461. Okay. So it's right there. It's kind of, okay. So it depends on how the next two, obviously as we stand now, it would be 2A depending on the growth that happens over the next two, three, four years, it could potentially be 3A. Understood. That's correct. And for everybody's knowledge too, our realignment committee going through this process, we will also look at numbers as well as caps for each classification. 
All right, President Stallworth, uh, yeah, you want to direct any other questions or comments, I'll let you do so. Again, any other questions or comments? Uh, at this time, we're looking for a motion. All right, this is Pam. Uh, you guys got a lot of work ahead of you, I'll tell yes, you that now. But I would like to make a motion that American Heritage Academy has been is granted new membership with the NIAA. This is I would, se Ron I would second that. I'm sorry, this is I, I think somebody got ahead of me there. Go ahead. This is this is member Cavazos. I would second uh, Vice President Sloan's uh, motion. Thank you very much, Ms. Cavazos. We have a first and a second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The eyes have it. Congratulations, American Heritage Academy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, going to agenda item 15, the full membership applications for the 2022-23 uh, school year for possible action. The board will consider full membership applications for the 22-23 school year. Uh, Crystal Ray. Yes, in, in Innovations is withdrawn from, from this item. Okay, good. B, Innovations is gone. They're off of the item, agenda item list. And then Pinecrest so Sloan Canyon will be the second one. So yes, if you'd like to direct it to Ms. Lotz on our on yes. behalf of our office staff, she will again direct our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Lotz. All right, we currently have uh, Ms. Christopher Zuno from Crystal Ray here to present. Um, I, Mr. Zuno, you are welcome to go. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Stallworth, Mr. Nelson, and the entire board. I uh, just want to thank you all today for giving me the opportunity um, and for considering our membership, our full membership into the NIAA. Um, two years ago, when we applied for associate membership, we were accepted graciously by you, and we thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, uh, we hit the pandemic right after our approval was, was given. Um, Things have been at our school heading in the right direction. Uh, last fall when sports, uh, last spring when sports opened up, um, we were able to field a men's soccer team. Um, and then when spring sports began, we were also able to field um, a track and field team. Uh, this year as sports fully opened, we have been very successful in fielding teams. Um, fall sports, we've had girls volleyball, boys soccer, girls soccer, um, along with uh, a small cross country group. Uh, this winter, we have men's and women's basketball, which we've already started playing. Um, and we are planning for boys volleyball and track and field for the spring. Um, our facilities have been wonderful. We've been able to host volleyball games in our nice gymnasium, um, also soccer uh, games on our field over here. Um, we have had unfortunate situations where we had to cancel games last uh, in fall sports last year. We did have to cancel one boys soccer game due to um, eligibility issues with a couple of our players and travel. Um, this year, due to COVID protocols, we had to cancel some games. However, we were also we were also able to reschedule some of those games that we had to cancel for COVID protocols. Um, our basketball, men's basketball team actually tonight is hosting our first home basketball game. So that's been, uh, so far, everything has been a successful endeavor for us. Um, I want to thank also Mr. Nelson, Ms. Lotz, also um, Tim Jackson um, and your offices. Uh, anytime I've had questions and reached out, you all have been so super helpful to us. Um, and we're just, we're looking forward to be a, a part of the NIAA Um as far as our enrollment is concerned, uh, we did have we did take a little bit of a dip last year, but that was only due to choice. Um, we took only 66 freshmen last year because of um, being hybrid. We wanted to be able to safely space our students out. However, this year our admissions team has gotten us in that number of around 100 students, and we're planning for that in the future. Currently, next year we're looking at in the neighborhood of 330 to 350 students total for our school, and we will be full. Uh, uh, will be full of students from freshman through senior year. We have just up to juniors this year, and next year we'll plan to be freshman through senior year. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're excited right now, and um, you know, hoping that this. Uh, this works out for us so that we can be full members participating. Um, I think everyone has been wonderful to us over this time. Um, I've reaching out to various athletic directors, their help in, in guiding me through 
you know, this difficult time, but also just getting us started in, in, in participating in the NIAA. Um, and then, like I mentioned, Mr. Nelson, Ms. Lotz, and also um, Mr. Jackson and his office, you've all been super helpful to us um, with any questions that I've had as far as, you know, how to proceed forward in different situations. Um, if you have any questions at this time, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Hey, Chris, Bob Northridge, how are you? I did a site visit. Uh, your gym wasn't quite done. And I know uh, your athletic field was, it was just getting done that day. And that was beautiful. Um, your gym, you were having some concerns about the number of seats you have in there. How did that work out? Correct. Yes. And thanks. For, thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, Jim is completed. Um, we're still uh, we're going to still be in that 250 to 300 seat range um, for for our gym um, right now. Uh, I'm working on how we can add additional seating, but that that right now is where we're at. Um, we have a lot of space between where our bleachers end and the sideline. So um, I'm looking into being able to expand that so we have larger capacity for our home games. Right. Because the concern would be. Yeah, you became a member. You have to host a playoff game. That'd be awful tough in there. Um, yeah. And and you have restroom facilities and showers and stuff there. We do. We have wonderful locker facilities, showers all set up inside there. So yep, we're all set that way. Okay. My my last question is: You guys are such a unique uh, schedule set, and and that your kids have to work yes. to attend the school. Did you find any issues here in the last year, year and a half, where kids had to work and couldn't participate or vice versa? We, we've had days where students on their work days have not been able to participate, but we've been able to field large enough um, rosters where we, were, we, we have not had to cancel any games due to work days for students. Um, the only thing we had this year with our girls soccer, we've played a couple of 9v9 games. Um, but again, the other schools were very gracious with us and helped us out with that, but we have not had to cancel any games because of our work program. Thank you. Hi, Chris, this is Pam Sloan. Going forward for next fall, and I'm just gonna tell you right now, if you come aboard, uh, I, have this, I have a number of questions here. First of all, for the fall schedule, you're looking to compete in the same sports in which you competed this year, such as boys and girls cross country, boys, girls soccer, in girls volleyball is that correct for the fall yes. of next year yes. and then also in the winter you're looking for boys and girls basketball yes and in spring track and field for boys and girls and boys volleyball yes so next year, next uh, year. the concern is if you are approved today is that what we don't want to see is that you come forth and say hey i want to play boys volleyball then after one year drop it off and go to something else that becomes a scheduling nightmare uh, I do believe right now with the two schools that are requesting for full membership in Ray Parks, you're going to have to speak on this, is that they would fall into the 3A. Well, before I go any further with that, I'd just like you to know and the board to know, especially you, Donnie, is that Tim Jackson has already created and submitted the, the fall schedules out to school, so he will have to modify that. In addition to that, I'm going to go back to realignment. If we were to add Crystal Ray, even just one of the programs, Crystal Ray and Pinecrest Sloan, is that it would exceed uh, the numbers in 3A. So now we have another issue in with uh, what do we do with that and how it affects the realignment. So um, do we have to move a school in the 3A to go to the 4A? And if that's the case, um, this comes to the NIAA, what do we do with that school and the potential of them appealing to remain? Mr. Parks, I'll have you offer comments first and then I will uh, address Ms. Sloan's comments. Just mirroring what, what Pam has to say there. So our goal up here was to keep this 12 team like we've talked before in the realignment. So in the 3A North, the 12 team works great. Of course, we're having some issues right now due to the COVID thing and everything, but to the best of my knowledge, all 12 of our Northern teams would like to remain in the 3A and keep that going. We're real, usually a real unified group. So with that said, that's why we went to 12. That's why we got bigger is because we wanted to mirror the South and keep 12 and 12 or as close as possible. Everything's been going fantastic. We send two teams to state, they send two, those kind of things. So it's all worked out perfectly. But when I talk to my friends in the South, 
these schools that come in with just a sport here and a sport there are really causing scheduling issues for them. But I know that we're, we voted to maintain single A, double A, triple A, four A, and five A in the South and probably one through four in the North that's up in the air. So there are places for the bigger or the more advanced three A to move to four A, the lesser or the, the less uh, qualifying, however we want to say it, five A's to move to the four A. So there is some opportunity for movement there. But I don't know the ins and outs of, of the South, and I don't pretend to, but I know I certainly understand their frustrations with scheduling and their frustrations with having a solid 12 in team sports. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Parks. Yeah, this is one of those odd ones, right? We got into a COVID year, and so we delayed the start of the realignment cycle by a year. And obviously, a school like Crystal Ray is – kind of stuck in the middle of it. And if my calculations are correct, and Mr. Jackson, Mr. Davis, please, by all means, feel free to correct me if I'm incorrect, that we would be, for the sports that are uh, offered on the application, uh, we would have it to be bumping schools. And from the three to the four eggs, we'd be at max numbers, I believe, in all of those sports. Boys, girls, cross country, boys, girls, soccer, girls, basketball, boys and, uh, excuse me, girls, volleyball, boys and girls, basketball, and then track and field, boys and girls, and boys volleyball. I believe we are at max on all those, and that would create uh, an additional process then to go back in and, um, based on the rubric scores, move the school out to not exceed the number. And then, yes, uh, member Sloan, that would be correct. We, we would, I guess the board would be, have, may have to entertain an appeal on such yeah. requests from a, from a story school. So, uh, Tim or Bart, if you would, please make, make sure I'm correct on that. And Donnie, you're also forgetting that we've moved. Uh, we had Coral Academy, who's already in the boys soccer, who didn't field a team this year, is looking to bring their team back. We mm -hmm. also have uh, the Meadows floating around out there because we let them play up into the 3A, which then creates a whole other dynamic because uh, they sometimes they have a boys team, sometimes they have a girls team, sometimes they have no team. So we, uh, we're looking at a lot of different things here. My question would be, if we were to do that, do we have enough teams to bump another team into the foray that we aren't going to start getting into the point where we're at a protected team based on our limitations in certain sports? That's a good question, Mr. Jackson. I'm going to jump in with something that we haven't talked about yet. And that's that we do have a sport playing out there where we already have 13 teams in the 3A. So for one year, is it out of the question to increase that number to 14, given the, the situation that we have with two schools coming in who, had we not had the pandemic year, would have been in on time on a realignment cycle and wouldn't have forced a movement for a team in the middle of the cycle to an entirely different classification that our realignment committee and our board have determined should be in that first classification to begin with. So I think there's an opportunity there. Obviously it would take an appeal to what we have accepted through the realignment committee and have passed and adopted through this board to go to 14 for a year in those sports where we have the issues, it doesn't create a real problem in terms of state representation, obviously, because we're still looking at numbers that are close enough, much as we do in the 5A with nine teams in the North and as many as 14 teams in the South. It's a little bit outside the box. It's a little bit different there, but I, for one year to bump somebody out of a classification that we've determined they belong in based on numbers, based on our voting, to then suddenly tell them, no, you're at a completely different classification with all new teams just for this one year. I'm not sure that's really the way that we want to go, but Mike, that's Mike, up to the board to decide. Mr. Jackson? Bart, I'm going to counter that with then why did we adjust the realignment cycle if we didn't adjust this cycle? I don't have an answer for that one, Mr. Jackson. I I, I agree with you. We, that hey, was something Bart, that we... Go ahead, Ms. Sloan. Bart, I'm sorry to interrupt. What, what sport do we have, 14? I believe it's bowling. We got 13. In. Well, actually, one of the teams dropped their level, uh, dropped the sport. So actually, we we actually went right back under the number. Yeah. They didn't offer it. But we they, we, they, we were ready for 13 at that point. Well, I know. But yeah. we did end up on it. We had we we're ending up a little lower than under the number. They decided not to field a team this year. So we had bowling. And I think I, I understand what you're saying, Bart, but it's, it's the counter argument that I'm coming back with is we, we adjust once. Then we adjust twice. We, we have not gone through a cycle yet where we haven't readjusted every league 
at least once during the cycle. Uh, and, and trust me, uh, Chris is doing a great job at, at it's not just Chris. And I'm not saying we're not for Amp or excuse me, I'm sorry, Chris, for Crystal Ray coming in. I'm just saying that we, we've got a situation here where we have a cap on a league that's getting too big. And I think that's our problem, that the cap on the 3A is too large because we're trying to squeeze it in to make it fit with what they're doing in the north. And no offense to Mr. Parks, I agree with his argument. But at the same time, we have to look at the representation in the south in the 3A is growing. We're, we're, we're growing and we can't hold everybody. But Ray Parks, uh, northern 3A, and I, I appreciate all that. And I'm not saying that um, you guys have to stay at 12 forever. You know, that obviously the north is not going to grow. We're, we're opening one school in there. Rollins can talk to that. Um, but I don't foresee anyone else moving whatsoever. But I realize what you're doing in the South. But the concern, and you guys deal with it every day, is you need 12 or roughly 12, 13, 14 schools that have real sports, that have real team sports. They don't just have an a individual here and there and a team here and there because that's going to kill your overall Southern 3A league. I'm not a dictator. I, I realize you guys need 14, 15, 16 schools. I get that. You guys are blowing up down there. I don't want to get it back to where there's only three. You know, that's where all this started in the South and the double A. And that's where we did all this, but we made all these adjustments. And, you know, we brought in North Valleys, which is twice, sometimes three times the size of some of our AAA schools up here. And they fit great because that's the level they should be at. You know, we have Sparks and we have Wooster and Hug. All those fit well with us. That's all I'm getting at. I don't, you know, I get it. You guys are going to be bigger than 12 down there. That's a fact. Hey, Ray, you know, Mr. Jackson's done such a, uh, and Mr. Davis too, done such a real good job in, in that. Let's just say for football, a lot of these charter schools don't have football. If they brought in teams down from the 4A, so we have a 12 team 3A league. So all of our leagues in almost every sports have a minimum of 12 teams. What's hurting now is, now we have to tell some of those schools you got to go up because we have these charter schools coming in. But for the most part, these charter schools are, are trying to do it the right way. Uh, unfortunately, most of them won't have football and never will plan to have football um, besides slam and probably matter. But uh, other than that, um, you know, they're, they're kids wanting to compete. Well, Bobby, I, I understand that completely. And I understand the football part. Um, I'm just trying to get away from the schools that aren't doing it the right way to tell you the truth. And, and I'm just, you know, me, I'm straightforward. So I, that's I, I agree. Nope. And Ray, we, we have, we have a school down here that's not doing it the right way. I can tell you that right now. That's, that's, I would say skirting our regulations. I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm making a point here. My point isn't who the team is. It's the number of teams in the league. That's where the issue comes in. I, I have no problem with, with putting another team in the league. My issue is that we, we, we have an alignment. We, we change the alignment. We have a cap. We're not just impacting the team that wants to come in. We're impacting the team that's being moved to another division into another league. And there, and it trickles up to as far as it goes to the 4A. We, we have a situation here where if we put both of these schools into the 3A, which is where they will fall, if I'm not mistaken, Bart, correct me if I'm wrong, that will then create a cascade effect of moving one to two teams from the 3A out of their league into the 4A, which will cascade the 4A leagues into complete realignment of the 4A leagues for one year. And that's, that's exactly where I'm at. We did the, we extended the realignment for obvious reasons because we didn't have any real sports. So in my eyes, you got to extend this as well. I realize that doesn't make these schools happy, but logistically, and for this to work properly and to give it the time that you guys all say we needed to give it, it needs to wait just like the realignment needs to wait or we're never going to fix this. We're never going to catch up. And years from now, instead of actually having these schools come in when they should, where we can schedule them, we're going to have this same problem year after year after year, and I'll be long gone. You know, the, pand the pandemic threw a, a real big wrench into this because they were doing their stuff on time. And, that, and that's unfortunate. But I think for one year, for one year, my my belief is that these schools could come in. We, we don't have to move any schools up to the 4A. 
we'll just have two more schools in those sports for one year. Then in the next realignment, we go right back to the 12 on 12 and we're on cycle again for odd years for schools to come in. Well, and, and Mr. Northridge, we've talked about that in our realignment committee too, of, of making that a hard and fast rule of the possibility of th this is when teams come in and, and making those years. I want to correct myself from earlier. I apologize. I mentioned bowling is the sport with 13. It's actually girls swimming that we had approved 13 in, in the 3A. Um, a couple of those are traditional 1A or 2A schools who had a few swimmers, Adelson and, and uh, White Pine was the other one that we had approved into that 3A. So there is a precedent for 13 team um, 3A for part of, part of the cycle. I, I, again, with what Mr. Northridge said, I, you know, it, it's no fault of these schools, but obviously we have to look at both Cristo and Sloan Canyon, which have these teams in to take a look at where those numbers are going to be. And I Bart, I would, like I'm not arguing that we have precedent for allowing them in for competition, but they don't take up a spot in representation in the postseason either. And both the, th the 3A across the board has set up their own internal scoring system for how they get the representation into the next level for, for the state tournament and the regional alignment there. Um, we don't take those schools into consideration in swimming because it's, it's done differently. So I, I think we got to be very careful when we say we have precedent. We do have a precedent, but it doesn't affect, affect postseason in any way, shape, or form. This would. This would affect postseason. You, you're correct, Mr. Jackson. I'm not trying to sway this one way or another. I'm just simply pointing out what we have at this point. Mem Member Wagner, do you have a comment? If not, I will make a comment, and then we'll move from there. Did I, did I see your hand up? Yes. I just wanted to, to make a statement that in looking at this one, um, We've been talking about when they have associate membership, this is the time when they build their programs. And in looking at this school, um, besides girls volleyball, that's the only junior varsity or freshman teams that I'm seeing. All the rest of the stuff that I'm seeing is just varsity only. And I thought the idea was that when they were associate member, they were building up their teams. And then when they would go into being a full membership, they would have the junior varsity level as well. Ms. Wagner, I, I would say we, we would be very careful on that one because we're, we're struggling across the board, across the state, 3A, 4A, and 5A to fill all levels. So I, I know what you're saying. I agree. Um, and it does cause situations where we don't have games at the lower levels, but we're, we're struggling uh, mightily in the South as well. In the 3A and 4A and 5A alone, we have quite a few teams that are not fielding full, full squads at this time. Um, I, I think the, the big push from, from our standpoint would be also that the consistency of at least fielding the varsity with building into the JV is the key as opposed to the three levels. I don't know if the number of students in each building, which you understand, you, you have a limited supply of, of bodies to fill all three levels and, and you're doing a great job out there, especially in football, by the way. Thank you again for that this year. Um, but I think we got to be careful with that because we could get down a slippery slope because we have some schools that are large schools that are having trouble filling lower levels. Heck, we had a 4A school this year not field a varsity level team for the first time in my recollection, Ms. Sloan. I just wanted to make a comment about that, especially with the JV and the two levels, because that is something that the 3A sees over and over again, and our kids don't get into play. Right, and it is not a requirement to have lower levels. It is determined about the varsity teams in the specific sports. So here, here's where we are. Uh, obviously, I, I'm speaking not for you, President Stallworth, but uh, we, we could look for a motion. And again, the realignment, uh, excuse me, the Board of Control has the ultimate authority even over the realignment committee. So there could be, uh, within a motion, the ability to increase, I guess, the available league size in the sports that are being requested by these two schools or, there may not be a motion. And in that case, the schools would come back and we'd look for membership uh, start next year, I guess, with the start of the cycle. But, but I think the Board of Control has, if it deems any one of these two schools, either one of these two schools, to be worthy of full membership heading into next year, I believe that motion could be made uh, with the caveat of, again, if it wants to, to expand the maximum size per the particular sports. Uh, if not, then I guess the motion could always be made that we need to go reevaluate what uh, 
a school that maybe moved up to the 4A in those scores. So there, there, I think there's some options here in the motion or not. But we were going in circles a little yeah. bit on this, and, and I think we'll do this every single year. But at this particular time, we need a, a, at least a motion or some movement uh, with regards to the direction we're going to go. So if there's no motion at this particular time, then uh, the school would stay at associate uh, membership. That's correct. It would, it would fail for lack of a motion. And then it would be brought back at this time next year for full membership. And obviously, again, we, we know that well, I'm, I'll reserve at that. Yeah, that's what happened. So I, I think, yeah, you, you need to call for a motion and see if we get one and give it, give it a few seconds. And my third attempt to call for a motion on this. There isn't one. Um, I'm not hearing one, so it fails so for lack of motion. Because of lack of a motion here, um, we're going to go ahead and move on. And, um, yeah, so our, our office staff will, if we are failing for lack of motion, uh, Mr. Zuno, our office staff will continue to communicate with you, and you will remain on the status of associate. And we'll work with you towards a, another presentation at this time, a year from now, for full membership. That's how we'll go. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, taking the time to consider us today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay. We will We will go to Pinecrest Academy. Pinecrest Academy. Pinecrest Academy, Sloan Canyon. Um, Lori? Yes. We've got Michelle Riley. Um, from Sloan Canyon here, Michelle, you're- Good morning. Good morning, President and uh, Board of Control. I'm Michelle Riley. I do have a presentation. Am I able to share my screen? You can go ahead and share. <clears throat> oh no, I just got kicked to preferences. This is not good. Okay, my apologies. And, and I can direct the, the board liaisons to beginning on page 172. That, that is where the application begins. My apologies, I am on a new device and it's not letting me share my screen. Well, there goes technological difficulties. That is not a good thing. Hold on one more try. Here we go, sorry. And again, if it, if it doesn't work, understand that the uh, electronic age here, we can always go to page one. Oh, there we go. All right, you perfect. should be able to see it. I apologize for that. I, I didn't have the share settings set up. My apologies. All right. So welcome. I appreciate the time. I am Michelle Riley. I, this is my first year at Sloan Canyon. I recently left CCSD after being there for 12 years. I was a teacher and a coach uh, within the district. And prior to that, I was in Texas and in Florida. Uh, I am here as the athletic director uh, for Sloan Canyon. Sloan Canyon is a new property. Uh, it was opened in 2019. Uh, we are a current associate member of the NIAA and seeking full membership. We are a tuition-free public charter school. It's part of Academica. We're situated in the southwest corner of Henderson over near the M, all the way uh, near Inspirata. Sloan Canyon opened its doors in 2019 as a K-9 charter school. Currently, we are through 11th grade, expanding to 12th grade next year. Uh, we do have an educational philosophy that wants to support learning opportunities, raise academic achievement, and promote civic responsibility, all of which can be uh, fostered through athletics. Uh, my heart and soul has always been in athletics, so I hold that very near and dear to my heart. Pinecrest, uh, our mission as a school is for us to unite the community to prepare our students for college and career. 
And our vision is for scholars to perform at the highest level on all academic measures. We do hold our athletes to the same high standard that any other school would. Over the years, we have grown uh, over two years since we've opened our doors. Um, our opening enrollment was a 1235. Uh, this year, uh, we're at 1705 and we're projected to be around 1900. And that is from K through 12 projection for next year. As far as high school enrollment, currently we have 416 students and that is projected to increase next year once our eighth graders move up to approximately 571. Let me move you off my screen. So uh, this current year, uh, our 2021 athletic participation uh, entailed, uh, we had in the fall, we had 24 volleyball athletes. We had 10 cheer and 13 cross country. Currently in the winter season, we have 34 JV and varsity uh, flag football players, 11 JV men's basketball and 12 varsity men's basketball. Uh, here's a picture of some of our facilities, uh, our gym, which was recently finished. I'm not sure if anyone has been able to see it yet. Beautiful view of our court. I took that the other day and I'm standing in the stands on the other side so you can see a full court view. On the bottom left, we are in construction of our future weight room. The equipment has come. The room has been established. We're just waiting on our mats to finish this. And then finally, in the bottom right is a picture of our field. Um, our girls played their very first home football game on that field Friday night, and our boys had their first uh, sanctioned game non-scrimmage uh, last night at our home, our home court. So as far as team sports is concerned, uh, as mentioned in the fall, we had cross country, women's volleyball, JV, and varsity level and cheer. It is proposed next year to introduce soccer into Sloan Canyon's list of sports for the fall. Some pictures from our women's volleyball season on our home court. Currently, we do have the JV and varsity level, both flag and basketball for the men's team. Uh, we have winter cheer. We are looking at introducing bowling and definitely a women's basketball program, both levels, JV and varsity. Some more current pictures just recently taken on our court. And current season view of our field where our ladies played their flag football games. And plans for the spring, we do have intentions for doing track and field, introducing men's volleyball and continuing with cheer. And there's a very high interest in both men's and women's golf amongst the student population. And because we are a K-11 currently school, we are able to build our own feeder program. So if you look at this screen here, it shows us our K-8 sports that we have at the elementary and middle school. In elementary, we have multiple levels of each one of these sports. Uh, we have cross country, flag football, volleyball, coach pitch, and t-ball, basketball and cheer. And in middle school, there's many levels. Um, we have the one cross country team. We have an A and a B girls volleyball team, an A and a B flag football, and there are an AB and a C team for boys basketball, as well as cheer. And we are lucky at Sloan, we have some non AAA affiliated. We are in the process of developing an AAU team for this spring for our men's basketball program. Uh, I've been working on that in the background along with Coach Patterson, who is our head coach of our men's program. And we also are lucky enough to have an amazing lacrosse program that has bridged multiple different facets in our community. Uh, our main coach, he is actually a retired uh, professional lacrosse player, and he has brought such excitement to our field for that. And it continues to build our community engagement. We are also community partners with the Raiders. They rented our facilities uh, last year. Uh, we are situated on the back side of the Raiders practice facility off Raiders Way. Uh, and I continue to, I want to continue to build this relationship and see what kind of uh, benefits we can get with our students partnering up with the Raiders and the community involvement. 
myself and the administration at Sloan Canyon, thank you for your time and consideration. Are there any questions that I can ask or answer for anybody? Hi, Michelle, Bob Northridge here. Good morning. Um, how are you? I, I just have some concerns. I know when you guys first opened up, um, it, it seemed like everything was going well. And then since then, you guys really in the last month have gone through three ADs, correct? Yes. Yeah, it, it was just, I, I don't know. Uh, and one, not even one of those, one previous to that, there were times I reached out to ask some questions and, and, and things and never got responses back. Never. That was that was very frustrating for me trying to come down to do a site visit. And, and it would be months later when I got a, uh, a response back from that person there. I finally did get to come down and do a, uh, a facility site visit here uh, early, like in August this year. And, and I had some concerns, you know, then, um, I, I, yeah, your football field is awful close to your school building. And I know we have another charter school in, in the city too, that, that they've had to put pads up and things like that, just out of the, uh, our member schools having a safety concern of how close your school building is to the, the end line of the uh, 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 football field. And also the, um, the scoreboard too. And I don't know the NFHS regulation on that. They were just starting to put that up and I suggested they put it back further, but that's kind of awful close to your football field too. Anyway, just some some uh, general comments there. I hope you're here to stay because it's been kind of frustrating here the last probably two years, you know, getting communication out of Sloan Canyon. Well, if I can answer that. Uh, so yes, there's been some turnover and I am not completely sure on the history behind that, but uh, I came over to Sloan uh, this year with bells on very excited to be there and actually my intention was to actually start the women's program when i first came and there was not enough time to get a team up and running when the conversation started and then our former ad returned to ccsd and i took over for him uh i am first day i'm here i'm not going anywhere um, I have been in very close contact with Tim and Lori the past three weeks since this has been mine. In the last three weeks, I have made a lot of progress. I, I, I can say um, I'm proud of what I've been able to accomplish in the last three weeks when this was handed over to me. Um, I, I was an athletic director when I worked in Florida, so this isn't my first rodeo going down this road. Um, I, you know, I'm very compartmentalized. I immediately, you know, got my binder and I started organizing everything. And I've sat down and had meetings with administration and uh, support staff to get everything properly aligned and things that weren't done have been addressed and are still in the works being addressed. Um, definitely there were some, there were some ma major flaws and I'm not saying that I've fixed them all, <clears throat> but I am aware of what needs to be fixed and I know how to do it. Um, and hopefully my last few weeks here have proven that I am capable of doing that. Right. Yeah. My other one was, um, I know, so you had a year where you guys started, then the COVID year, and then kind of this year still, still looks like you're, you don't have a sport, two sports in the fall, in the winter, in the spring, you're hoping to do that next year. Uh, is that correct? Uh, this current fall, we had volleyball cross country. Okay. Um, cross country was both male and female. Volleyball was just female. Currently, okay. the winter season, female flag the football, men's JV and varsity level uh, basketball. basketball. Um, and then prior to that, the previous season, COVID put a little caveat in that. I did yeah. a lot of homework oh, trying to find out, you know, and a lot of digging around the campus with, you know, because I, I dug through RMA trying to, you know, yeah get a, a bigger a grasp of the bigger picture. Um, and I went to coaches to find out, uh, you know, so the COVID year definitely put a damper on that. Uh, but they did have both boy, uh, male and female participation in the sports that were offered. And where, where were you guys going to uh, practice track and field on? Can I ask that? That we have not established. I have not locked in anything. Um, first, I was trying to find interest. Second, I was trying to find a coach. Um, and third would obviously be the location where we could rent facilities for that. Thank you.
absolutely. Now, President Stallworth, if you want to direct any other questions or comments at this point to okay, our board members or liaisons. At this time, do you need a motion uh, to accept this or, or not? Looking for a motion. Going once, going twice. Uh, no motion has been passed at this time here. My press will stay as associated member. That's correct. Yes, and then uh, Ms. Riley, our office staff will work with you on approaching this again one year from now with back to uh, full membership allocation. If you again so intend to pursue full membership, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate moving. your time. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, we're moving to agenda item 16, the opening of the executive. Uh, nope, uh, sorry, 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 President Stallworth. We're going to go to, uh, we, we have other one other item with uh, presenters, and that is going to be number item, item number 12. 12. Item 12, please. That'll be the North Tahoe and Incline High School petition to amend uh, the 1A, 2A, and 3A Northern Region Soccer Alignment. So, and that is begins on page 55. 55. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine, sir. Hey, Mr. Stallworth, Ray Parks, can I chime in real quick? Okay. Mr. Stallworth, sorry. Yeah, I just, oh, I had an email from the principal of, I believe, North Tahoe to give him a call. And I had this crazy incident all weekend. So I apologize. I haven't got to speak to him yet. I just want to make that clear that I, ha I apologize. I haven't got to speak to him in advance. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Thanks, Parks. Yeah. All right, page uh, page 56 is the letter of introduction from the principal of North Tahoe High School. I believe the presenters uh, will be the assistant principal and the athletic director from North Tahoe and the athletic director from Incline High School. Ms. Lodge, yes. from our office, you have the coordination of those individuals that are in the waiting room. If you will go ahead. Yes, and they are all in the meeting already. Okay, thank you. With that said, um, Mr. Padilla, are, are you going to be the one to lead this off in your presentation on behalf of the two schools? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to start off and then I'll have uh, Thomas from Incline and Laura Delorier step in Very good. after you, my introduction. Okay. Let, let me know when you guys are ready. Yeah, the, uh, I'll do, do a quick little, actually, no, the, the floor is yours, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you to the NI2A Board of Control for, for their time. My name is Alejo Padilla, the assistant principal at North Tahoe High School. I do just want to start off by saying um, our, our intent of this presentation is not to circumvent the realignment committee. Uh, North Tahoe High School will respect the decision of the realignment committee because uh, we believe that North Tahoe High School fits very well within the two-way league for every sport but with the exception uh, to soccer. And so we're proposing uh, that the NI2A Board of Control review the proposal from North Tahoe High School and Incline to make the best decision for, for all student athletes. Uh, so North Tahoe High School is a school of 479 students. Um, 80 of our students participate in, in soccer. Uh, in boys varsity, girls varsity, and at the lower levels, the JV. And um, the two-way league just cannot support a comprehensive schedule. Uh, there are only five varsity boy teams in uh, the, in the two-way, and there are seven girl teams. Um, and there are zero JV boys and girls teams in, in the two-way. And this really impacts us with, with having 80 student athletes in the soccer program. Um, JV boys, for example, this year only had five games and they were all with three A teams and with five A teams. Um, another issue is our school district, the Tahoe uh, Truckee School District is having the same issue with finding bus drivers, just like every other district. And especially in the fall season where um, just our transportation schedule and our athletic schedule is just uh, really impacted. 
and um, we are still fulfilling our commitments for our away games. However, we are having to order charter buses that increases the price significantly. So for example, North Tall High School spent $8,200 for just three soccer games. Um, also, the proposal that was sent out by uh, Incline uh, will reduce or basically eliminate overnight um, overnight um, stays. And we all know that those are getting expensive with hotel costs and travel costs. And um, it's just gonna be hard to justify that ongoing, that ongoing cost. Um, so the proposal that's being offered is only for soccer, therefore respecting the realignment committee's work. The proposal will help with competition, scheduling, and helping the athletic and transportation budgets. The 3A West and East Leagues were created to address these very issues. And that is one of the reasons why we're making these proposals to, to uh, address the same issues that the 3A um, uh, address. And so now I'll defer to, to Thomas from Incline to, to review the survey that he sent out and also the proposal and the breakdown of possible uh, league change. Thank you. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, so we, we have a survey that was completed and I see it's rolling and there were 20 total responses. I broke it down in a PowerPoint if that's easier to see. I don't know if it was on a mobile device or not. And I understand I was listening to part of the 3A and the concern of the realignment and the one year fix. And we know in the last realignment cycle in 2020, there was a verbal direction that we would be able to pick up some games against some of the 3A schools. Um, as Mr. Uh, Padilla stated, there were seven girls teams that finished the 1A, 2A season, and now it's saying that there's going to be nine. So if there's going to be nine girl teams, we'd still like the boys to be able to pick up those games. And if it could be by geographical region, if let's say the 2A, for example, is able to play in the West that are on the West part of the state, and if the Eastern schools can play on the Eastern part, and then when we get to regional, let 3A have their regional tournament and let 2A go into their regional tournament, and then we can reevaluate this at the March realignment meeting for suggestions that we would propose, which is one, allow the rubric to go beyond those schools at 500 and come below schools like North Tyler at 479 and we're at approximately 340 currently. So I understand we're a little bit on the big side. Um, we don't have as many soccer athletes as North Tahoe does. We still face the same transportation issues and the scheduling was a challenge. Um, if we had one team play, for example, Wattel with the girls game, they kept getting challenged, changed through the officials didn't wanna just officiate that one game, they wanted two games. So some of the schools didn't always have a boys team or a JV team. So we were constantly rescheduling. So we were trying to pick up other games. It wasn't possible due to the full schedule of the 3A and the lack of officials and then trying to find game places to play. Um, obviously, Incline had some issues with that. That's not for discussion here. But when we look back at this in 2020, I don't, you want me to share the PowerPoints? Would that help um, NIAA board? Thank you, thank you to our presenter. So the, the real question that I see it is uh, NAC 385B.630, and that's the requisite for the number of teams in a classification and or in a region to be able to be justified to have that tournament. Uh, I think many of us know that you need to have nine in a, in a classification of a state tournament. You need to have three to have a region tournament. Uh, again, with 2 a girls soccer, with the commitments that we understand, even though we had seven finished this year, that we will still have nine teams in girls soccer. But it, it appears that the commitments next year in the fall for 2A, 1A, 2A boys soccer still is at five, not, not going back. So the question is, how, how do we handle, you know, we, we did call the 2A this year, even though we don't currently have a Southern based team in the 1A or 2A, with the Meadows not playing this year, uh, I believe there's one other school that was thinking about it, I won't name it, uh, but didn't, didn't play clearly. What do we do to facilitate schedules for perhaps 2A boys soccer? Do we tie 2A girls soccer into that? There's really some oddballs in this to, to do it. Um, it sounds like, Mr. Reimer, if I, I'm going to summarize it for you, but I, again, I'm not, you're, you're presenting. So if I'm out of character and you want to clarify me, please do so. It sounds like what you're saying is looking at 2A boys soccer specifically and asking for a, a 3A northern region 
East League and West League, in essence, to be scheduled separate and apart from each other. And then the 2-1-A, 2-A schools that are East-based would join them during the regular season. The 1-A, 2-A West schools would join them for the regular season. But then you would still be able to break out for a 2-A region tournament, 1-A, 2-A specific region tournament, because you do have the number of teams, three or more, to have that aspect of it. Uh, that's where, again, I, I, if, if I'm incorrect in my summary, please let me know. Mr. Parks would certainly want to jump in and talk about what the 3A thinks about soccer in particular, looking towards next year, scheduling apart East and West leagues for one year until we get to the, through the realignment process and decide what we really do with 1A and 2A teams heading into the start of next realignment cycle. So again, we're like a lot of things, right? In a, in a COVID year, we're, is that the, the COVID did, did eliminate some programs and I, we don't see those programs coming back for one more year in the current cycle. So Tom, let me ask you first, is that a correct summary? And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Parks. Yeah, so uh, we have a couple of propositions. One is to try and combine these 2A schools with the 3A based on the geographical region to try and decrease some of the travel costs and increase academic seat time. We understand that there's a push. Um, Larry mentions, their AD mentioned in an email that it takes them four hours to get to White Pine if they were to play them. Um, if we could get some crossover games so that these schools are getting some competition to prepare for a regional match when, like you said, there's only five teams that finished in the season, there's only five predicted for next year. So that would be a regional and not a state tournament for the boys 2A because there's no 2A, 1A in the South. There are no 1A schools in the North that are in soccer. Um, when we looked at this, it was only us in North Tahoe out of the 2A, 1A that wanted to combine with this. The other 2A schools did not, but there were seven schools and the North 3A that agreed to allow us to come and play up with them, mostly in the Washoe um, area. And then there were the other schools that did not want to move up and play some of these schools. I think their, their fear may be the bigger competition or the bigger schools um, and the fairness of that. We're looking for the competition. We're trying to keep our kids in class longer, not having to travel as much. Um, for example, White Pine for us would take six and a half hours, not using West Windover. But, that, but that's fair. I mean, and we sent out the survey. We're trying to follow the guidelines. We went to the realignment meeting. We petitioned to try and stay together, but we were told at that time there would be two teams from the South. And you mentioned that both teams did not materialize. So that kind of cut down the numbers from the South that were going to be able to participate. So it's it's going back to what I believe I heard um, Clark County mention. They don't have enough schools in some of the leagues and it's the cascade effect. And it's like, what do we do with the 2A? And I think that's going to be up for the realignment meeting committee meeting in March, which will uh, present as public speaking with our suggestions or ideas for them to consider. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Parks, I will direct uh, traffic to you, please. Thank you. So uh, aside from the South Tahoe athletic directors, I personally spoke with every, all of our 3A Northern member schools. Um, to be completely honest, Nortal was extremely difficult to deal with scheduling wise the last time we did this. And some of you are aware with the specific issues that we had at a, an incline game where my coach got his job broke. So obviously they're not really in favor of this. However, um, when I talk to them and I try and explain the, the travel issues that we all have, and I want it to be real clear, we're a 3A league. We're an Eastern division in a Western division, but we feel we are the Northern 3A league. So when I discuss with them, you know, where these travel issues are real, transportation issues are real, um, academic seat time is all real. We've got to change the way we think. But um, Donnie, I've talked to you about this. We'd love to look at getting rid of the current 5A boys schools, having them go into back into their 5A soccer or if it winds up 4A or so on, and then entertain the thought of an Eastern 2A, 3A soccer league and a Western 2A soccer league, excuse me, division, and then we all come together. I think we can make that happen knowing that when I make a schedule or Don makes a schedule or somebody, I can't handle Tuesday is senior day. We can't play that day. I can't send Spring Creek 300 miles to have a game on a Tuesday because they have something spe special going on. The schedule is set. It is what it is. If you make a commitment with another school, by all means, do that. If you can make those things work. But when someone's coming from Timbuktu, which is Spring Creek, Elko, and Lowry High School, 
we can't accommodate a, a change you know, to a Wednesday or something. That schedule has to be set. Anything you can do locally, we're fine with that. If you can get officials, if you can get administrators, you can get gate takers, you change it to a Tuesday, say it's Nortal versus trucking, by all means, do that. But you got to respect that the rest of us are traveling that far. So with that said, um, I think I think they could entertain the part where we do have a 2A, 3A United soccer if we can get rid of the 5A guys because that one's being very difficult because it's only 5A boys. And again, we don't want to move any of our 3A guys down. We think it's great that they're playing at that level. The Sparks of the world and so on, they're competing at that level. We want to get away from just because they move down, we got to move some up. That's not the way we're thinking. So that's where we're at. Uh, thank you, Mr. Parkson. To be, be clear to everybody, there is not a request for an agenda item by a principal to overhaul the northern soccer setup with, with 5A, 3A schools at this time. So, no, uh, I, I, and I agree with Donnie that has, this has all just been talk. But I am a principal and I have no problem, you know, making that request if I need to. That would have to be agendized differently at, at another meeting. So what we have in front of us for today is the, well, the proposal, the, the proposal is what you have on, in, in the paper there. And again, I would interpret that proposal to be separating 2A3A West and 2A3A East with the schools that currently exist and then bringing in the current 1A2A schools. If there's a motion to that, if, if there isn't by, by procedure, uh, lack of emotion would mean the 2A West or the 2A boys, because it's, it does just know the school at that point, that would be a region tournament still because they have more than three teams, but they don't have nine teams. And that's how it would play out for the remainder of this realignment cycle, which would be one more fall season. So is that Mr. Stallworth? Hopefully I'm fair to both sides and explained options properly. Uh, if you want to ask for more co questions or comments, we can go that way and then eventually lead to a motion, I would have believed. Well, if you look at the, the, the survey, um, it looks like I, I think it's split 50-50 down the, down the line with regards to the, uh, the proposal um, and talking to the, uh, the 3A West. They really didn't have that much of an issue with it uh, at all. And I, I think uh, Ray... Uh, hit it on the head with the, with the East were, um, they want things to stay the same. So at, at this particular time, we need a motion to either accept this uh, proposal or um, keep things the same for at least one more year until another realignment. And President Stoloth, if I might, just again, I want to make sure to, uh, to Mr. Padilla, who's on here as well. If you, if you do read on page 56, they, and I know Incline North Tahoe have been working together to try and formulate a joint proposal. Obviously there is, there, there's a statement about North Tahoe petitioning to, to the 3A. And so there's kind of a, a dual, dual petition proposal. going on. Yeah, and that's, that makes, you know, for what yeah. that's worth of, yeah. In, 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 the, in the past, uh, before this season and before uh, COVID, we did play in the 3A for, for soccer, so um, there there is precedent in us playing in the 3A. We would definitely like uh, to move with with Incline, and uh, we we support Incline's proposal. I think it would be probably the best. And 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 also though as well, uh, just how Ray Park uh, was talking about um, respecting schedules. Um, we would definitely respect schedules if. This proposal would would go through, um, and and also it, it kind of goes with with what he was saying that it it is difficult and there are schedule changes and the team is traveling uh, hours to get to a competition. Um, by making this change, it, it does help out with if a schedule does need to change because it's easier to do it from Truckee to North Tahoe or or incline. Uh, to Truckee, it, it just helps out the situation for, I think, for everybody at that, um, for, for soccer. So I'm in support of, of the proposal that inclined, but if 
North Tower High School for boys. If we, I, I would also like to support us moving to three for, for boys soccer as well. Well, it, thank you. I, I think it would have been helpful during the process of the survey that, um, that the 5A, uh, three soccer teams in the 5A that have uh, been selected by the rubric to go down to the 3A was involved in this specifically to get their viewpoint to see if they would prefer to stay uh, in the 5A, which Ray had brought up. And uh, I think that the 3A would say, hey, if those, those three 5A schools would stay up in soccer, then we would open up the idea for allowing, uh, am I correct, Ray, in, in allowing um, some of these schools to move up to fill out, fill out the schedule in the 3A? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, I, and we, you know, uh, McQueen did very well in boys soccer. They're the only ones that have told me they would like to stay. The other ones indicated they'd be open to moving. But now with the potential realignment, that's why all this needs to happen during realignment, Rollins, as we've discussed, because then we can make it clean. We can make it all set up. They can have their appeals and we can know exactly when we're doing all this. And I realize this has been a nightmare with COVID and all that. But if we don't do things right, this poor board is going to be having appeal after appeal after appeal. And that's not what the NIAA board is designed for. When you have a realignment committee, in my opinion, that's what it's designed for. So we bring an entire package to the board because we do the nuts and bolts of all this, as you know, Ron. And then the board can read through what we recommend and get it all together at one time. So I know it's another year they'd have to wait, but I think we could make it all work if we met and had some time and made real schedules, made real proposals so that we knew where every single school was going. Well said, and, and at this particular time, we need to see if we can get a motion on this um, and, uh, and, and move forward. Can I just give a quick two cents? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Laura, I know the presentation time, I think, President Stallworth, you want to grant one more minute of presentation time? This is, this is Laura Delorier. She's the athletic director at North Tahoe. Our yes, director. I will grant that to her. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, we would not have put the, together this pr proposition this year, and we would have waited till next year if it weren't for the just the fact that there were seriously only five teams in the entire boys' division, plus the fact that we were, um, I, and I get it, it was probably due to COVID a lot of it, but we were told that our JV teams were gonna be respected and we would be able to pick up games with them. We were unable to do that. I tried everything. I sent out tons of emails. I made phone calls. Couldn't get JV boys or girls games. And we have, I mean, between that, that's 40 kids that aren't playing games. They're dressing out, they're practicing five Rollins, games for my boys. Hey, Rollins, real quick, last comment from Ray Parks. Go ahead. I can guarantee that I can help with that for next year and I can get games for both Incline and North Tahoe from our 3A member schools. I can help with that. If you can help with that, I have zero problems waiting for the league next year at the realignment when it comes up. But um, we, you, I mean, you guys know as athletic directors, et cetera, the amount of phone calls that I had from JV families was crazy. Like I wasn't doing anything. Like I was had my finger at my nose all season waiting for something. Um, so that would be super appreciated, Ray, if you can do that it will make us happy. But I also, um, I don't think that our teams that fight so hard during the season, um, just because we do have five boys teams, please don't take away a state opportunity for those, for the two way at that point either. So anyways, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not this item right now. Right, thank you. Second. That's not decided right now as far as that's concerned. So if we can knock out one of those issues that you had, uh, and, and raise uh, assistance, uh, we'll, we'll do that then. Uh, I think we've accomplished a lot just with this with this communication. So thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. Um, so let's see if there's a motion. Again, uh, I'm looking for a motion. Uh, first, second, 
there, there is no motion here, so there's no movement on this particular uh, issue. Thank you guys so much for the work that was done with the survey. And I'm sure that uh, Ray and myself uh, will use this information as we move forward in our 3A discussions, uh, not only with um, the 3A schools, but also with those 5A schools that are playing 3A soccer and see uh, what, what we can do as we move forward with this um, through the rest of this uh, cycle. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, it, it's 11, just about 1140. Uh, the next set of items will be legal information. Yes. Uh, one of those items might take some time. It, it may be before we get too far, this might be the point for a, a 30 minute break. Okay. And then depending after that, and depending on those next three items, again, we, we have a little bit of an, of an idea where we're going. And we can see how far we get after that. Does that sound reasonable to, to you sounds, at this time? That sounds reasonable. So yeah. I, Vice President Sloan, does that sound reasonable to you? This might be the break time. Okay. Thank you. We'll take a break time till uh, 10 after 12. Sounds, sounds we'll right. We'll take a break, uh, break to 10 after 12. We're good. Okay. Recess. Recess. Thank you, everybody. All right, see you in, we'll see you in 30. Okay. Correct.
Yeah. All right, everybody, welcome back. We'll get going here in uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. And we will start off with item number 10, page 48. I'll let uh, President Stallworth introduce us here in just about 20 more seconds. Lori, are we back on to our YouTube? We'll wait your, wait your guidance on that. We never left YouTube. I'm gotcha. starting. Yeah, I'm starting the recording again. Starting recording now. Is, that was my next question. Very good. Thank you. All right, yeah. President Sowers. Yep. On to agenda item ten: uh, legal information uh, for information, and informational and discussion items. Mr. Paul Anderson, you're on. Okay. One second. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so. Uh, I don't have a lot to uh, to discuss as far as level two appeals since um, September. We, we had only had one hearing um, in the fall, and that was prior to the beginning of the September uh, of the uh, when we had the meeting in September. <clears throat> um, we prevailed on that matter. We had one hearing last week, um, and that's. Uh, uh, that's under submission with our hearing officer, uh, and another one um, that that one was up here in the in the northern part of the state. We have another one set for this Thursday down in Las Vegas, um, and there may be another one or two that are sort of in the queue, as I understand it at this point in time. But again, the number of level two appeals is down for the second year in a row, primarily because of the COVID situation. Um, and, and so that, that's what kind of explains that. Um, as far as other legal updates, uh, not a lot to add there. Um, various issues that come up during uh, uh, the last couple of months between our two meetings here. Um, I worked with Donnie, <clears throat> uh, interesting uh, assignment for me was, was working with uh, with the Raiders um, just prior to the uh, state football championship dealing with their lease situation. Uh, that was, uh, it, it was interesting and, 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 a, and a heck of a deal. And, and, and they were a, a great bunch of uh, legal professionals to work with. They did us a real, real favor by uh, basically giving us that facility that had no charge other than uh, some parking charges. But um, other than that, that's that's about it. Unless anyone has any questions. Thank you. No questions for at this particular time. And President Stallworth and uh, Mr. Anderson, if you would to just speak up just a little bit. I know we're on one device here in the room. 
uh, people can hear you, but just to be a little bit more clear. Sorry, sorry to interrupt both of you. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, now we're going to go to agenda item 13 with our flexible uh, agenda today. We're going to item 13, NAC revisions returned by the Legislative Council Bureau uh, to the board for review uh, for possible action. Who's on? Yeah, that is on page 61, everybody. 61 on your, uh, in your packet. Yep, and uh, I'll, I'll take this, Mr. Anderson, just to start us off with the, the say, as you, as you see in our packet, it's R04721. That is what's back, addressing regulation 385B 750 through 786 concerning academic eligibility. I am very proud of what our rules committee accomplished uh, with regard to this academic change and thankful for the Legislative Council Bureau that it saw fit to write the regulation as we presented it. Uh, this amended rule is going to benefit our student athletes, and I believe it's going to create uh, more equity across the state with regards to academic eligibility. So I don't have a whole lot to say. We, we've gone through this. We've done our due diligence, obviously, to get to this point, and we are ready for a, a final motion and approval. But I'm going to turn over to Mr. Anderson for, for a comment. Yeah, all I, all I want to add, I would echo what Donnie says in terms of um, the return of the regulation. I was a bit surprised to see that it was uh, pretty much adopted verbatim, which is great. Um, so at this point in time, the way our regulation process works, as many of you know, um, there, we have to have a vote on this now by the board. If the board approves uh, the, the academic uh, eligibility regulations, uh, item C here, um, then what happens is I will I put together the packet that goes ultimately back to the LCB. Um, it's then ready to be approved. There, there will then be a hearing with what is called the Legislative Commission, and that's a, uh, that's a group of legislators who meet uh, periodically to review regulations for all the agencies in the state, and uh, typically we, we get these approved. It's, uh, I've never had one that was uh, sent back. Sometimes they uh, have some questions for us, but uh, this would ultimately probably become law within the next 60 days. So that's where it's at if we get the approval, which I am anticipating we do. The other two, I mean, I would add the other two items that are on there uh, are still outstanding regulations that have not yet come back from the LCD. Uh, we put them on just in case we get them um, between the time we file uh, or, or we post the agenda and we have the meeting. Um, they did not come back timely, so we, those are items A and B are not, uh, we're not able to consider those at this point. So this is an uh, action item, so um, at this particular time, we are looking for a motion. Joe Beecher, I will motion to approve the language presented. This is Pam, I'll second. We have a first and a second. Any questions or comments or suggestions? None. All those in favor say aye. 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 There's a couple of you. Any no's? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Uh, on your agenda item now, we are going to agenda item 16 the opening of the executive director's position for possible action. That's page 204 of your packet, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Um, again, for the benefit of uh, board members and liaisons who are relatively new, um, when, when Bart uh, Thompson um, retired uh, a year ago, well, it wasn't a year ago, but se several months ago, uh, during the process leading up to that, we had discussion about um, the next executive director, the board uh, agreed at that point in time that, uh, that, that they wanted Donnie to serve in, in, in the capacity of executive director. Donnie uh, took the position that uh, he would serve this year as an interim, but he insisted that we uh, post the position um, so that a decision could be made roughly around the time that we have our next meeting, our spring meeting in March. Um, he wanted uh, to see how it went and also to determine whether he wanted to reapply, uh, but to also give others an opportunity to do so. 
Um, so what I have, what we've done is placed in your packet um, information that I have in my directory from the last time we had hired a full-time executive director, which is going back to like 2000 and uh, what was it, uh, 15, uh, 14, yeah. something like that, yeah. when uh, when Eddie Bonine had, had resigned and we, uh, we went into the hiring process, the search process. I think some people were on the board at that time that are still here. I know many of the liaisons for sure uh, were involved uh, at that time. Um, but anyway, what I've done is I provided Donnie uh, with that information. We've updated some of the dates in terms of how the process would go. Um, during the lunch break, Donnie and I talked about the fact that these, this was uh, the last time we did this, it was somewhat of a condensed schedule that we put together. Um, and the reason for that was the resignation of uh, Mr. Bonine happened right in the middle of the year. And we were left without a, uh, uh, an, an executive director. So there, there was somewhat of, a, of an urgency to get the process moving as quickly as possible and get somebody in, in uh, place. And that ultimately turned out to be Bart um, Thompson. So this can be modified, this timeline. Uh, and probably should be because it's, it's a, a fairly aggressive timeline. Um, and, and you can certainly look at that and discuss the dates as to when certain things should be happening. Um, the next document talks about the announcement of the vacancy uh, for the, and, and, and kind of opens up the position and, and sets forth the required skills, uh, educational background and that sort of thing that the uh, association requires of the executive director. And then the final uh, couple of pages are, were the basic uh, application um, that we used. Um, it's only a two pager, but basically there's a lot of material that was attached. It would be attached to that. So when these packets would come to me uh, as counsel to kind of monitor this process, um, you know, they, they were fairly, fairly thick uh, uh, sets of documents. The board last time had me serve as the individual uh, kind of monitoring and, and, and uh, uh, handling um, the receipt of applications and whatnot. That was done purposely um, just to uh, uh, expedite the process and, 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 and move it along. Um, I have no, uh, uh, I, I don't know how I would even put it. I, it, it. If I wasn't in that position, it wouldn't, it wouldn't break my heart. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, but if, if that's how this board would like it to go again, I'm more than happy to do it um, and, and uh, work in that manner. But uh, beyond that, uh, you know, it's a matter of, of you all looking at, at these documents and primarily the timeline, I guess, um, to determine how you want to proceed. With that, with that said, um, you see the uh, minimum requirements, the scope of the search and the application process. Um, how do we want to move forward? Um, do, do we usually ask for volunteers for the committee? How does that I say? I, I don't feel like I'm not going to jeopardize the process in any way, shape, or form. I think a couple things need to happen. One is I, I believe the board would have to appoint somebody. And with all due respect to Mr. Anderson, I'm not trying to give him any more work on behalf of our association, but he, in essence, would be the chair. We would then have to have a, a screening committee and those two things would have to be formed today. And then also within this, we can look at a timeline and I'm more than happy to also offer, again, if it's not being a conflict of interest, offer maybe uh, an amended timeline to this. And then to address what, uh, again, on pages 206 through 209, with regards to the requirements and all that, I, I would venture to guess those are probably pretty sound. Yeah. With, the, with the way we are. Uh, 
with the way we are with that. Um, one so I, I think we can, I think, so I think, again, I think it's, it's, it's naming a, in essence, a committee chair to this. I think it's naming a search or a, I'm sorry, a screening committee that would be then responsible to reporting to Mr. Anderson and getting together. It would then be a, again, a, a timeline. I can provide some amended dates to that if the, if the board would be so in favor of that. And then again, the announcement of vacancy and everything else to, to me seems very sound because it matches what was done last time. And I know the screening committee last time put a lot of work into the, the process and created that document. So and those are yeah. and those are additional meetings just with the screening committee and Paul yeah. with regards to doing that. Um, right. Guess, since since we have to do those, and Paul, I guess just by the position that you hold, would be the automatic chair in this. Yeah. I think you need a motion to, to we, name him, we, I would think. We would need a motion to. Uh, I, Paul, do you, I, I would think so. And I think we have to have volunteers. That would be a screening committee, and that would be a separate motion who would serve on the screening committee. Does that yeah, sound appropriate? I think maybe the board ought to discuss first yeah, of all, yeah. we want to follow the same process. And, and, and if so, then who, you know, how they want to form a committee and, and all that. So at this particular time, I want to get a, a motion from the board with regards to if we just follow this process here. Uh, we need to agree on this process first, and then from there, we will go ahead and select a chair um, uh, and, and move and select a, uh, a committee. Um, and I think that would be the best way. So at this particular time, I'm looking for a motion to accept this process for the opening of the executive director's position. This is Pam. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Pam. We have a motion. Do I have a second? This, this is Amy. I'll make the second. Good. We have Amy making the second. Thank you very much. Any further questions or discussions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. So now we have just passed the process in which we will open the executive director's position. Uh, now we are looking for a nomination for the chair. Well, let, and, and, and let me just you don't mind if I were to address just a couple of other things because there's certain questions that came to mind last time we did this um, as to how we would proceed. Um, in fact, I, I think one of the things that I received was uh, proposals from these different search uh, groups that that, uh, that hire uh, superintendents for school districts. And I know a lot of you that are board members may be especially in Washoe and Clark County are familiar with that sort of thing. Um, it's a pretty expensive process to follow. Um, and, you know, one, you know, just from the standpoint of the budget of the NIAA, I don't know is, is necessarily worthwhile, but I think what we did um, to, to make the, uh, the position known on a national basis is we uh, informed the NFHS, or the, the basically the uh, national association in Indianapolis, who uh, <laughs> all of the uh, state associations of that fact, and they distributed that information for us. And we did get a lot of applications from all over the country from different individuals that worked in um, associations, I think as far away as Georgia, I think there were one, one from there and, and, and some other parts of the country. So there is a way to, to open this up. Um, on a national basis, that's that's uh, fairly cheap. It doesn't really cost us anything, um, and uh, I, I just wanted to point that out. So those are things I think you need to consider. How you want to go about the process should be probably discussed at this point in time. Okay. So at this particular time, um, is there a a nomination for? A chair. Hey, Rollins, this is Ray Parks. I don't, I don't necessarily want to be a chair, but I'm more than willing to serve on any committees that that you guys need to help with. Okay, and and I think that screening committee would would come next. So once we can get the chair taken care of. Um, then we can go ahead and, and, and ask. I don't think we need to actually have a, um, a, a motion for the selection of the committee. 
I just think we would ask for volunteers once the chair has been selected. Yeah, or, or you know, there's gonna be an appointment process or mm -hmm. something, something along that. Something like that. Right. So let's get the chair done first. I know in the previous, uh, I know that uh, Mr. Anderson has served in that capacity in the past and uh, he's probably the most experienced person that's uh, involved in, in, in doing this before. So um, I'd like to get a nomination. Well, this is Pam. I would like that to be continued in, with Paul to remain as the chair. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Ron Gerzon, I'll second that motion. Good. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, we have a first and a second. Any further questions or discussions? Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. And congratulations, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> um, at this particular time now, we need to discuss then how is the screening committee going to be selected? Uh, would the screening committee also be the interview committee as well? Is that interview both before the board? No, the board, the board does all of the interviews. So what, what we did last time, and, and this is where the process gets difficult, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have people with some experience on, as far as the screening committee is concerned. Um, probably no more than two or three people, um, you know, should, should form that committee. But what we would do is open up the position, decide on what the timeline is going to be for that. Um, and, and that will uh, be clearly indicated to whoever's interested, you know, what the deadline is to apply and they would be sending their applications to me. I would gather all those applications um, and then uh, organize a meeting of whoever is the screening committee um, in order to bring back whatever the screening committee believes is appropriate in terms of candidates to be interviewed by the board. Um, and that those interviews, I guess, would take place at the, the uh, either the March meeting or we could have, we could have a, uh, we could have a special meeting to get that taken care of, we could, you know, however uh, the board decides to do that. But um, that's pretty much the process. Um, you know, I, I would distribute all the applications to members of the screening committee. We would have a meeting and, and like I said, make a recommendation back uh, to the board as to the finalists to be interviewed. Okay. So how, how is the selection or screening committee selected, Mr. Anderson? Well, I think the board, the board needs to make the decision as to who they would like. And, you know, Mr. Parks, for instance, made a, a uh, volunteer his services. I mean, if others, if there's others interested and, and you know, um, I think it'd be good to have a, an array of, of individuals that I- A liaison represented. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Mr. Parks being from a, a smaller county, um, I think that's good to have one person in, you know, from, from that, that represents sense. that type of, uh, of, of group or, or that, that sort of uh, uh, bunch of members of schools. And then okay. perhaps uh, at least one definitely out of the Las Vegas uh, area so that we have uh, good, good representation from down there. And, uh, and then also uh, perhaps in Washoe County representative or another Northern, another Northern Nevada representative, Washoe, Carson City, something like that, Douglas, any of those. Hey, Paul, should somebody from the staff be on there as well? Um, if, you, if you want to do that, that's, that's fine too. Paul, oh, this is Joe Petrie. I'm willing to be part of that committee if needed. You would? Yes, I, I would do it Thank if you. needed. And all this, you know, I, I, I'm really pointing out to everybody what we did last time. That doesn't mean that's what we have to do this time. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, if any of you have other thoughts, I think those should be shared and so you can make your decision as to how you want to go. Well, we know that the, the board is going to make the final decision with regards to the applications, the ones that the individuals who will be interviewing and the board will make the decision on who is selected as the uh, as the next executive director. Um, I, 
I think that the um, this committee is extremely important in terms of winding winding that search down to the, the prospective candidates that we would be interviewing. So um, I don't think there should be a limit placed on how big or small that committee should be. I think all interested members of our of our board, whether they're uh, appointed members or whether they're liaison members, if they're interested in being on this committee, I think that uh, you should say something now and uh, forever hold your peace and, and, and we'll get that stuff done. Um, at this particular time, we have Joe Petrie and um, um, when the Mucka and Maori represented with Great Parks and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, Pam, uh, I'm somewhat interested. Are you interested as well? Sure, the two of us. I, I, would, I, I really think that the president and vice president should be involved in, the, in that process too, speaking for uh, myself and Pam um, and, and what we do and, and who we represent. I would love to be involved in that. And Pam would, would too, not speaking for her, she's mentioned that herself. So. Uh, there are four members. Anybody else thinking about being involved in that process? Um, this is the time to, 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 to speak up. Rollins, I would, I'll volunteer. Okay. We have Lori. Thank you so much. Rollins, this is uh, Russell Fecht. And um, as long as the schedule works out, I, I would be happy to serve on, on the committee as well. Um, Fantastic. Phenomenal. Thank you very much. Great. You know, this is Pam. I'd, I'd really like somebody to come forth that would represent the uh, private charter schools. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking about starting one here in Winnemucca. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll put both hats on you then, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, those uh, private and charter schools, come on now. Somebody's got to jump into the well with us. I, I can be a part of it if, 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 I, if, if I, I need to be, too. This is Brett Walter, Faith yep. Luther. Brett would be great. He's been around forever. I agree. So what are we up to now? I got seven. So we're up to seven, so that's a pretty good sized committee, especially with a committee that's gonna have to try to meet uh, in some capacities and- And whittle it down. Pardon me? And whittle it down. And whittle it down, so that, that, uh, that's a good number right now. So we gave everyone an opportunity to, uh, to participate. I appreciate those seven that have, uh, that have made the contra uh, contract and commitment with the devil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We'll see how that goes, and I uh, will appreciate your. Uh, so now that we have that committee established, does the board have to vote on that committee? I would suggest that you vote to approve that committee. Okay, so at this particular time, we have voted and approved. Our chairperson will be in Mr. Anderson. At this particular time, uh, Mr. Anderson, do those seven include you? No. So uh, we have a seven different. Um, additional board members and liaisons and advisors to the board that have volunteered to be on the committee. Uh, Donnie, you want to read those names out? Or Mr. Anderson, you want to read those names out? Sure. I, I've got uh, Ray Parks, uh, Joe Petrie, Pam Sloan, Ron Stoller, Lauren Lotz, Russell Feck, and Brett Walter. Okay, fantastic. We have those seven. At this particular time, those are the seven uh, volunteered. Uh, I need a motion to accept those seven. President Rollins, it's Ron Gerzon. I motion to accept the seven committee members for screening. Thank you very much. And now I need a second. Matt Hyde, second. Thank you very much. We have a first and second. Any further discussion? All I would like to add is, is at any time at this particular time, if one of those seven for some reason just cannot make meetings and just are having a difficult time, that we just go ahead and continue with the six if, if, if that becomes an issue as we move forward. And I want that to be a long and accepted uh, person who may uh, run. Um, would you go ahead and agree with that, that that would be the case that we would continue if we lost? A committee member. 
That's Ron with that. Uh, Ron. 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 Ron here's on you. Yeah, you you muted the seal. I'm sorry, was a question directed at me? I apologize. The question was that if during the process of uh, the seven members and our chairman working on the application screening that if for some reason one uh, of, the, uh, of the committees, uh, screening committees can't commit to those dates in which we are meeting and breaking down applications that we can continue the process until completed. Absolutely, I would agree to that. Okay, and then we need the second to the second. Would you agree to that as well? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, at this particular time, all those in favor say aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to to working with you all. And, and uh, thanks so much for for volunteering for that. As we're following our uh, agenda here, we are going to move to uh, agenda item number 11. Do we guess we need to do the timeline, Paul, on that? Are we, um, or can yeah, that be handled? Did, did we agree oh, you know what? We do yeah. need to go back. We have to finish up. So we, we selected timeline. the chair. We selected yeah. the screening committee. Now we got to work on a timeline uh, to get that done. When, uh, when is the date for the, uh, the, the end of the current contract that Donnie's under, and when would be the time that we would want to have the process of the interviews and the yeah. possible selections? So, so that's that's the thing. We we have plenty of time here. Um, Donnie's contract runs through June thirtieth of this year, um, so we have at least till then, or at the latest till then, to have a new executive director. Obviously, it'd be nice to have somebody hired and ready to go. If it's Donnie, uh, if he chooses to reapply, that's great. If, if not, then whoever the new person would be, uh, it'd be nice to have them in place prior to June 30th. Um, so we can begin the, you know, the next year. Um, so like I said, the, the timeline that's in your packet, page 205 is very aggressive, especially looking at this in terms of the holidays um, and whatnot. Um, Donnie and I kind of looked at a couple of uh, maybe another option um, in, in terms of when we had opened the position and, and then uh, go from there. Donnie, you have those views? Yeah, uh, looking at the, the opening position again, just some, some ideas that would be uh, what you see on there January 18th. I, th I think we've got an extra week that could be available in there, letting everybody get back from the break, get settled within the buildings. Obviously, that, that's, that's being internally focused, but, but also regionally and nationally focused as well. I think Monday, January 24th, seems to make sense on a date that the opening that position would be posted and opened. Uh, going past January 24th, possibly of an, of an application deadline of, uh, again, assuming states and getting through the end of February uh, with regards to people and my colleagues and other people around state associations, maybe look at that date being Monday, February 28th to get through, again, that, that weekend through the end of February with winter sports for many people. Uh, and then going to a screening committee reviews, I think that would make sense then to be in the first week of March. Uh, the recommendations for interviews to the board for finalists can certainly come right out of that meeting. And that would again also be some point in the first week of March. And something that we did, we've done in the past too about holding interviews in front of the board of control was to tie it into the spring meeting. And our, our spring meeting is scheduled for March 22nd, 23rd. Uh, it, it may be that we could hold interviews the, the morning of the first day on Tuesday, March 22nd. And understanding then if we did that, the board meeting going through Wednesday the 23rd might go longer. <laughs> it might take us a while to get through that regular spring agenda if we do interviews. But again, th those are some dates. So Monday 24th possibly for opening and posting position. Monday the 28th for the application deadline. That's a February 28th. Uh, first week of March for screening committee. First week of March for announcing the finalists and then interviews on the 22nd. And then at that point, the Board of Control could announce the new executive director on March 23rd as part of the ending of the Board of Control meeting. And if, if I uh, could just comment, um, I, I truly believe that we should have a separate board meeting for, for the, the interviews. Um, well, I think when you try to condense it in with a, a board meeting, it, it takes away from 
um, the importance of what you're doing as a group, uh, as, as a board. The decision you're making is a gigantic decision um, moving forward in, as far as who you hire as the executive director. And I, I just feel you should have, you know, nothing else to be thinking about or worrying about other than that interview process. Uh, but th those are just my my thoughts. I, I agree one. My, I agree one hundred percent on that process. I think that uh, if we have to go a third day or against the original meeting, or have we usually have a two day meeting. One day is just for the interview. Second day is the uh, NIAA meeting or something along those lines. And to comment again with what Mr. Anderson said, I think our spring meeting is going to be a pretty heavy agenda. I'll be honest. I, I don't. I don't know that we can. Even though I just mentioned that. I think Paul, you're probably. I think you're probably on track. I think it needs to be a separate day yeah, like or a separate meeting. In, you know, yeah. after that meeting, um, and I, I guess then what we got to look at also yeah. is what everybody's spring break schedules are as far as uh, those sorts of things. But but finding a date maybe in April to do the interviews. Or right, you better make arrangements. It could be Zoom. It could be travel in person. I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously the speaking is going to have a little bit of work to do in figuring that out. Yeah, so, I, I would think that all hmm. the, the, the interviews need to be done in person. I mean, I, I just think that's the way you got to go with that. Um, so, I mean, hmm. you know, these are all things that, um, you know, that, 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 that need to be decided, obviously. And, and I don't know if, um, if we can get all of this resolved today, but yeah. uh, maybe you get the position opening date solved, the application deadline solved, and just the general frame of the screening committee meeting in the first week of March and preparing finalists or, or determining who the finalists will be in the first week of March. And then let the screening committee in that process determine when, when interviews would be to present to the board of control. I'm not I mean, worried. If the yeah. board's okay, I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, Paul, I, I'm trying to be yeah. conflict of interest here in what I'm offering as well. So, so that, so, you know, I think that is a proposed motion is, is that we do have a timeline to establish, to establish the process in which a selection committee would be selecting possible candidates, mm -hmm. um, actually selecting who would be interviewed in that timeline. And the only thing that's open at this particular time is the actual interview process and date. And I guess what, what you could potentially do, depending on how you set this timeline up, is that decision, when you're gonna do the interviews, could be determined at the March, March board meeting. The, mm -hmm. the March board meeting. Okay. That's where you could determine what the date would be for. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Sure. So with that said, we need a motion for that. Or, or discussion. I, I don't or discussion. Know what I, I don't yeah. know. I think yeah. that um, it's, it's, it's really tough to get a, a, a motion from the board when the screening committee hadn't even met yet to kind of look at the schedule and see how that works and how what their time frame looks like. I mean, I think we're doing the work that the screening committee should really be working on in terms of finalizing what that calendar, what that time frame looks like. I think this group, you know, as a board right now, we're not thinking overall, but, you know, once that committee of seven gets together with the chairman and start working on it, I think that they're going to be the best case scenario with regards to how their schedule is going to work with the timeline, given that we need to have our finalists at least selected by that March meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And from that March meeting, we can decide what that, what the the actual additional board meeting will be and, and how it will be set up individually for the completion of the interview process. Right. So if the board's agreeable to that, then you know we can certainly go that way. I, I, I would invite some comments from those of you on the board that may have gone through this process before and, you know, with respect to your individual districts and whatnot. Um, this is Matt Hyde, and I agree with President Stallworth. I, I like that plan. Letting, this, letting the 
screening committee set a timeline from that point forward. And, and we can do that, uh, you know, fairly quickly depending on people's schedules. I'd be happy to meet prior to, the, prior to Christmas to, to decide those things. Um, mm -hmm. That could be a Zoom meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we yes. set that up pretty easily, I think. I can only make it if Paul's going to do an all-expense-paid lunch on his dime. <laughs> Whatever you said, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> So if that's said, Mr. Starworth, maybe Member Hyde has just made that motion. So Member Hyde did yeah. make the motion that we will actually uh, reserve the right of the, the steering committee to make that decision based on what the schedule will look like at a predetermined meeting um, and, and send that out to the board. I don't know how that works. Do they send that out to the board? Or? We, well, yeah, if the board's giving the screening committee the authority to set forth basically with the timeline. Is yes. that correct? Um, yes. Right? Yeah. If yes. If the motion, then yeah, then that's what we would do. That's the motion and that's what we would do. We have that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion, but do we also need to put in there with the understanding that the higher, with, with the higher date of June? Oh, yes. That would all stay the same. That, that part of it would all stay the same as far as the conclusion of it is concerned. I think our biggest uh, aspect is setting up the time frame in which we would have the selection process done by the March meeting. And at the March meeting, the board will establish a time when we will have an additional meeting to interview and select the next executive director. Move second. Uh, Member Sloan did Sloan second. Vice President Sloan. Sloan. Yeah. Vice President Sloan. Any other further questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. And thank you so much for those volunteers for the screening committee. We appreciate your commitment. And, and before we get off this, I will make sure I've got everyone's uh, emails, which I believe I do. Um, and but I will be in touch with all of y'all. Get a mass email out here for the members of the screening committee uh, with some proposed dates that we can hope, hopefully meet within the next couple of weeks. And certainly, Mr. Anderson, uh, Ms. Lott from our office can provide you with those emails and other contacts, whatever whatever you need. So, yeah. well, thank you. Now we can go to all yeah. right. 11. All right, number 11 on page 49, please. We'll get, we'll get on a roll here. You know, our office staff has been engaged in a, in a few meetings recently with our, our school district superintendents, uh, with representatives of the governor's office, and, and jointly, honestly, at, at times. Uh, I can tell you that we have been notified from representatives of the governor's office that the testing mandate will remain in place through the conclusion of the winter sports season at the earliest. So that is a date of February 27th. That is follows the day after the conclusion of the state basketball tournament, uh, which would be the, uh, the final day of the winter season. I know skiing is right in there with dates to be decided as well, but it's right in that same time frame. Uh, with that said too, I, I, our office staff will continue regular means with the superintendents and regular communications with representatives of the governor's office. So what you have here in your packet, starting on page 50, uh, the most recent updates from November 8th through November 30th, uh, those updates to NIA guidance one with re with regards to face coverings. Again, they weren't updates to the testing program, but with regards to face coverings for the sports of basketball and wrestling and really in effect to coaches and officials and spirit team participants. Previously, and that goes back to November 8th, masking mandates uh, were clarified for bowling participants. So the most recent changes are reflected on page 52. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for flipping through those pages. So again, what you see there in the, in the green is the bowling. That was taken care of on November 8th. And then what you see in the top there, the those top four paragraphs are what came uh, through work with our office, through the governor's office, for face coverings, for basketball, wrestling, coaches, and contest officials. And... And the spirit participants were also, oh, they are, sorry, spirit participants are number four in, in that list of items. So 
those are the updates to guidance one. And I'll open up for any questions or comments. And other than that, we'll look for a motion for approval. Again, this is the board has given the authority to our office staff to be able to amend guidance one and work with the governor's office uh, with regards to all things COVID that we've been doing on a, on a regular basis through the authority granted by the board. So that's it, Mr. President Stallworth. I'll open up for any questions or comments. Thank you. At this time, at this particular time, any uh, any comments or questions before we? Do we need to approve this? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we do because it's it's almost a retroactive action. We realize that, and that's what the, the board granted authority to our office. But because this work went through the governor's office to get guidance one amended to this degree, yeah, we we're already board. acting it, but we need action. We need board. We, we need board action. We need to vote on. And uh, again, you know, this is a vote not to bring up other issues that have right. come up, but these right. are the guidances that we are going to run as an NIAA statewide and, and, and counties can't resort to interpreting this in any other way other than how it's written. Yeah. I just Johnny, to uh, I'll make the motion to approve the current update to the NIAA guidance made November 8th and the 23rd regarding mandatory face coverings. Thank you, Pam. Do I have a second? I'll second that, uh, Member Calazas. Thank you very much. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. I believe now right. we're going to go in. We're going to go in order. Go in, in order. <laughs> I'm going to leave the, uh, the Russian technique and go to the uh, uh, action item, agenda item 17, contract extension for eligibility officer for possible action. Donnie Anderson, number yeah, 17. Yep. Yep. Thank you, sir. And I'll have Mr. Anderson join back in after I give a, an introduction to this. You know, I, I will tell you on a personal level, and represent our office staff, we have realized how incredibly valuable it has been to have this position with our staff, especially this year, but the, uh, the position of an eligibility officer. Uh, Mr. Thompson has stated that he will continue in this position if it's approved uh, through the end of what we call the fiscal year or the end of the academic year, which would be through the end of June. And you know, we set this in place in trying to make a staff transition for, for my job, obviously as the interim director, to have uh, an extra person uh, help deal with the issues that face, you know, our office, Washoe County, Clark County, but are obviously tie in the entire state. And I know this is a position that uh, we have talked about at the board level in the past, incredibly valuable, but we're gonna go one step at a time. And obviously the transition of a new full-time executive director, keeping the eligibility officer in place would be incredibly valuable to our office staff. And what the financial ramifications would be extending Mr. Thompson's current contract through from February 1st through the end of June would be at $2,500 a month, obviously adding $12,500 to the budget. And speaking with Mr. Biesmeyer from office staff, we feel like we can accommodate that at this time. And if approved, then Mr. Anderson would draw up an extension and Mr. Thomas, uh, Mr. Thompson would agree then to sign it and submit it back to this office. So. That said, Mr. Anderson, I'm going to turn it over to you for any additional questions or comments before we leave into board discussion. Yeah, I mean, just from the mechanics of, of the situation, it would clearly be a, an amendment to the present contract that we have um, with uh, with Barb serving in the position he's in now. Um, I didn't have anything prepared at this point in time. I want to see what the board's um, thoughts were, and then uh, that that's something we can easily do. Um, you know, it's a it's a heck of a uh, a good deal to the association that we have here with Bart at twenty five hundred dollars a month. Basically, that twenty five hundred dollars is going to pay, I think, health insurance, um, isn't it? I mean, it's it's going to pay his benefits more than yes. it is any type of salary to him. So um, uh, that you know that it, it, it it's a no brainer from that standpoint. I, I think. Um, I'd like to make a comment on this as well. I, I can tell you this, the, this has been a position that this office has needed a long, long time ago, especially with the implement, 
implementation of the RMA. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, that, that our office is taking off my president's hand at the NIAA, putting on my coordinator of athletics and activities for the Washington County School District. It's been immensely uh, effective and it has impacted us in a positive way of getting kids cleared a lot faster, uh, having problems. In the past, I was uh, in issues that I've had. Not only is he dealing with the NIAA RMA issues, but he also is a consultant for issues that we have within our district. And uh, I've often called, called Bart, and I don't know how much Pam uses him, but uh, I use him immensely in cases dealing with district to district in Washoe County transfers as well. And um, this has been absolutely wonderful for us with regards to the expediting uh, eligibility and, and, and cases and, and people that we're dealing with are trying to get eligible two minutes before their game time starts. Um, so with that being said, I, I'm really supportive of this as well. So at this particular time, we're looking for a motion to accept this. This is Pam. Before I make the motion, I just want to say that uh, this is a valuable position. Uh, Rollins, I personally don't use Mr. Thompson anymore because I'm not on the eligibility side of the house. That would be Mr. Jackson and I. And uh, I have been very vocal with this board about the importance of just having somebody to do eligibility. I don't believe that it, it should be the executive director. So kudos to the NIAA for going in this direction from the beginning. Um, so with that said, I would like to make a motion to con for the contract extension to retain Bart Thompson as the NIAA eligibility officer through June 22. We have a, we have a motion, do I have a second? Matt Hyde, I'll second. Matt Hyde is our second. Thank you very much. Any further questions or discussions? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Motion has been passed. We need a vote on that, sir. We did not. Yeah, do, 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 do it all in favor. Oh, yes, yeah, do it all. It's okay. <laughs> we just need an all, all in favor. Need a call, call, call for the question. Okay. Call for the question. Just call, say all, all in favor. Call for the question. All those in favor. All those in, all those in favor. There we go. Say aye. 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 Thank you. Any nays? We, we had a little lunch that was delivered to you. All right. I'll slide, I'll slide track for a second. So. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, agenda item 18, thank you very much. Increase in contest fees for black football officials for possible action on page 211. Donnie, you gonna introduce Ellen? Uh, yes, I, I will introduce uh, Ellen Townsend, our officials liaison. This was on our agenda for discussion in our uh, fall meeting. And really, I'm gonna make a little comment that clearly this, this is an impact on the Clark County School District budget. Uh, with the participants being there for this particular sport. Uh, I have notified the superintendents of this item being on our agenda and have been given support verbally from the superintendents if this board approves it, superintendents. As, as we always do with increased fees for officials in whatever sport, I always ask the superintendents first to make sure they're aware of impacts of their budget. But with that said, the superintendents have given their favors. Let me turn over to Ms. Townsend uh, for a presentation, please. Go ahead, Ellen. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm back here again uh, with this proposal. Let me make sure I have it up right. Um, so we, I came to you back in, I think it was in September with this proposal and uh, was kind of uh, directed to, because this was gonna be very impactful on this year's budget ending in June, um, was asked to come back and present this again for the following school year. So what I'm doing here is asking uh, you to consider a request to increase the flag football official fees effective with the next school year. So the 2022-23 school year. Um, I've attached the current fee schedule uh, with this packet. Currently all NIAA sanctioned officials with the exception of the flag football officials are paid the same fee for officiating a varsity contest, a junior varsity and a freshman or B contest. Um, for, so just for example, the fee of 7125 is paid to all varsity sports officials with the exception of flag football. 
But those uh, varsity sports that use three officials, such as basketball and soccer, have a fee of 58.25. And then if we go to the freshman JVB levels, uh, except for flag football, all those sports are, are paid, uh, the officials are paid 51.50. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, myself and Vince Christosic and Pauline came before the, the Board of Control and we asked for a, a similar proposal uh, for volleyball and softball fields. So we're fees. So we're kind of asking now to kind of consider and address the, the pay disparity between the NIAA sanctioned sports officials that are currently um, affecting the flag football section. There's an agreement in place between the member schools of the NIAA and the uh, sanctioned officials association that officials fees you know, will be increased by the raise given to state workers the previous year, not to exceed 5%. So going back to 2019-20, workers received a 3% increase. And then the next year, 2021, 20, excuse me, 2020 to 2021, there was no increase granted to state workers. So what this meant was we're kind of a delay of a year to go into place. So that 3% increase that the workers got was delayed for us until 2020, 2021 season. And then this year, there were no increase in officials fees. So I've again attached that fee schedule for you to take a look at. And here's just a snapshot. Um, you can see that the current gap in fees. And what we're using here is the basketball, soccer, three officials uh, makeup because that is what the flag football um, group uses, our three officials to officiate those games. So the current soccer, basketball, three official makeup are paid 20, uh, 58 25 per official. Currently flag football makes 33.75. So you can see the difference uh, there about 20, 24, 50. And the same with the JV and the same with the B. Okay, you can see that kind of the, the big disparity there. Like football also uses three officials and they also have a, a clock a, a clock or a game official. And that, that person is paid $21 a game. Um, <clears throat> based on the information I got from uh, Vince with the Christosic, the president of the SNOA uh, in 2019, when we use these numbers because there was no uh, flag football season this last year or in 2020, there were 345 varsity games, 295, uh, excuse me, 293 JV and 259 freshman B game, B games played. So we used the same number of games and applied these game counts to what will occur this season using the current fees. Um, and there's a cost estimate of that. So at the varsity level with 345 games, 3375 times the three officials plus that clock operator. That is the total cost for the estimated cost for this season for varsity. Uh, $42,176.25. <clears throat> Applying the same number of games to the JV at 293 and the B at 259. Again, similar, you know, mathematical equation there to to, to provide those numbers. And I wanted to make sure that we included the clock worker in there uh, as a cost. Um, and there's one clock worker per game. Um, and those that is what the $21 sitting in there is for that. So the cost estimate for this year is approximately a little over $100,000. So using, I use those same numbers again for varsity, JV, B, for our proposed new fee schedule um, for the 2023, basically the winter season and have applied a, uh, a clock worker getting a $6 raise. And those are the figures there. So I'll just go through the first one. Again, varsity 345 games, the proposed fee increase at 58.25 with three officials, the clock worker increase to 27 and you come up with about 
little 69,603 and 75 cents and applied that again through JVB and the clock worker. So this proposed cost increase from this forthcoming season to a year from now is a little over, is about 60, $69,655.50. So this proposal is, is seeking a pay increase above the 3% for the flag football, the fees. These, these football, these flag football officials really are doing the same work, the same levels of competition as other officials and all the other officiating organizations. Uh, and we really feel they should be paid the same. NIAA has identical requirements for all the officials that desire to work in the state. Uh, registration fees are the same. Everyone must have liability insurance they have to pay for, they have to pass the, at this time it's a sports exam that's administered similar to the NFHS through Arbiter. Um, all these officials have to submit to and pay for a background check. All the associations have other membership requirements based on the NIAA officials association constitution, such as attendance requirements at mandatory meetings, association meetings, uh, completing specific sport training programs, whether those are in person or online or a combination of, of such. They really have to master the rules, apply them fairly in a professional manner, require, you know, they're required to submit reports if necessary. And oh, although not all the jobs are identical, you know, each, each official has something different in each sport the, really the associated duties for all the officials are the same and they really deserve some equal compensation. We do understand that and are dealing with not only difficulties in recruiting officials, but in retaining officials. Um, so if we could bring flag football fees along the lines of the other sports, uh, it would be comparable in fees and help them as a recruiting tool. I understand that many of these flag football officials also are basketball officials and a lot of them choose to stay indoors rather than go outside. Um, and I know that we're, we're just hurting for officials. So anything that could be done to help as a recruiting tool would be greatly appreciated. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this request and proposal and um, any questions I could possibly answer, I'd, I'd, I'd love to. Thank you, Ms. Townsend, for being uh, as truthful as possible and what the, what the fees are, what the costs are, and for doing all the data analysis. That's excellent. Much appreciated. President Stallworth, I'll turn over to you to see if there's any questions or comments, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments on that? Uh, if not, we need a, I believe we need a motion to accept. This is Pam. I did ask that for the last, no, the last board meeting we had talked about this and I had asked that we not take it to vote last time, but for it to be returned. I didn't expect it to come back so soon. But uh, with that said, I'll make the motion uh, for the increase for the flag football officials uh, for the school year of 22-23. So it goes into play next school year so I can appropriately look at my budget and plan. Um, before I proceed, um, I'd also like to make a comment, um, Helen, with, with the shortage of officials, um, I don't know what you guys, what conversations you have throughout the state, but I know that if, if my budget, if, if my cost is for three officials, how do I ensure that, I, that three officials officiated that game? Because what I am finding out that sometimes it's only two and I'm being charged for three. I don't know. I would like for you guys within the state to have a conversation and how you can ensure to districts that are paying these ungodly amount of money uh, that we're paying for the proper amount of officials. Because I know at times we're supposed to have five football officials and we only have four. So I know that's a sidebar conversation, but that's a conversation that I think uh, we as districts that are paying these bills um, I think I, I personally need to have a better understanding on how that's tracked as well. But I made the motion that we do increase the rate to be comparable to everyone else, as long as it's for the 20 beginning the 22-23 school year. Second. Good. Do we have a second? 
Rollins, I'll, uh, this is uh, Linda Cavazos. I will second uh, Vice President Sloan's uh, motion. Thank you very much. Any further questions or discussions? I have a question. Okay. Uh, question is uh, the JV proposed rate is at 5150 for two officials, but the three official rates 4525. Is there a reason why there's a disparity between those? You know, I, I talked to Vince about this and if you're talking about like the, what the soccer officials, is that what you're talking about? JV the basketball. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not aware of any JV basketball 4525, but I do see it on soccer. I, yeah, I do see it on soccer. Um, I'm not even sure if they use three officials in JV soccer. I, I couldn't answer that question. I'm saying that if it's comparable to, to the basketball rate of 5150 for two officials, but we're using three, why isn't it charged at the same rate as soccer for three officials, which is 4525? That's what I'm asking. I'm just looking for some clarity as to why there was a discrepancy between two officials and three official rates. Good point. My understanding is, I'm sorry, the best I can answer on that would be that most of the JV uh, officials are making 5150. I, I don't even know if they use three officials in, in, in soccer at all. Um, I think we're, you know, just trying to look at, trying to come across and, and be the same as all, all JV levels getting the same amount, the JV and B and freshmen. I will tell you this, that we we only use two officials at the JV right. level down south. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yes, only two. Okay. But that's a good point, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. We have a we have a motion and we have a second. You did get a second? Yes. Okay, good. We have a second. Thank you very much. We have discussions. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The eyes have it. Ella Townsell. Townsell, yep. thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, could I make one comment just to uh, what um, Vice President Sloan mentioned? I think that's a good point. And I'm not sure how each association delineates and provides detail on a billing, you know, but that's something that I, I can look at and make sure that we kind of come across and maybe look at the various districts, you know, what kind of detail do you want? How, how detailed do you want it to be? Uh, I know through Arbiter, we can, you know, have it come out in level capacity. <laughs> so we can show how many JV, how many frosh, how many varsity. Sometimes that's confusing because it puts, it doesn't put it, it puts it in a date order, but it doesn't align with, you know, the rest of the, uh, like a varsity. But a lot of them will, you can put it by level order and get detail. So I'm not sure how it's being provided, but that's something we can address and, and make sure that, you know, it meets what every school district or school wants. Yeah, so this may, that, that would be great because at the end of every season, I get this statement and we have to sit there and go game by game, level by level. And just, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of pushback from the district to ensure it's 100% accurate. But if some of the information we're given isn't, it, it just hurt, it hinders the process. Right, thank you. Hey, hey Ellen, this is Ray Park, so I got a quick question. Sure. I agree with Pam, that'd be great if I can have more detail. And then with having so much trouble getting these refs, especially out here in rural Nevada, is there a requirement I have to have three varsity basketball or can I have two if I can't find them? be my understanding that if you didn't weren't able to get three you could have two it's either that or don't play the game right yes so i so, just want to make sure i pass that on to all 12 schools that's my that'd be my understanding okay thank you it, it would be the same that a lot of times we have two officials in volleyball and if we can we can only have one we usually let the school know ahead of time we only can send one unless you don't want us to do that we're going to just send one Oh, no, we want yeah. you to send one. We want you to right. send two. We want, we want them, but I just want all these guys to realize it's a lot of new ADs here at these schools. So thank you. Right. Yes. Hey, Ray, uh, Mike Strong, um, 1A liaison. Um, I know the 1A, we, uh, we only used to. 
Um, oh, right cost prohibited for us to spend the money on the travel to get them here. So, um, and our level it works until we get to a region or state uh, competition. Cool. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Excellent discussion. Points made and Thank questions you. asked. <laughs> President Stallworth, we'll go to uh, number 19. Good. We're on uh, number 19, the liaisons committee direct reports for information and discussions. You're up. Uh, Russell, you're up first, representing the superintendents. Thank you. Um, I don't have a ton to report. I think that uh, our seasons are, are off and running. The school year is going. Uh, we continue to fight through um, COVID and all the challenges that have come with uh, everything you guys have already touched on, whether it's lack of officials, transportation, uh, testing requirements. Uh, Donnie mentions we've had a number of... Uh, um, I guess the best way to put it would be entertaining uh, NASP meetings and conference calls around the difference of opinions that we get through the different uh, processes um, related to COVID uh, in particular. It would be a great day when we're not having to discuss those things, but we continue to just face these challenges head on and, and try and provide opportunities to our kids. We appreciate the work of Donnie and, and that office um, and each and every one of our ADs and, and principals that are making it happen on the ground. And, and that's really it. I'm open myself to questions that anybody may have of our group. Um, otherwise, I, I can keep it short and sweet. Uh, class 5A, Northern Region, Mr. Levitt. Um, Bob Levick, Commissioner of the Northern 5A, Class 5A North Region Liaison, for the record. Um, again, um, echo what Mr. Fectus said, um, COVID is the gift that goes on giving, and uh, certainly it has for us here in the Northern 5A, uh, just in the daily work of our ADs, our athletic administrators at the school sites, and, and what they're going through just to get these athletes on the court, on the fields, each and every day. Um, the Washoe County School District, which represents, um, I think, uh, five of our nine schools, six of our nine schools that make up the Northern 5A just recently changed their vendor for um, weekly testing, which changed the days of the week that our athletic directors are doing testing. And that all affects everything that we do from um, our own meetings to our own schedules. Um, it's, it's quite impactful. But on a more positive note, I just, uh, my main point today is, is to share and to recognize and, and offer congratulations to all of our Northern 5A schools who made it through their fall seasons. We had very few cancellations due to COVID. Um, they got through the seasons. The kids had great seasons. And, and so congratulations to all those schools that that moved on to regionals and to the state and got the opportunity and the experience of, of competing in a state championship tournament. Um, special congratulations go out to the Reno boys cross country team winning a state championship and the Galena High School girls winning a state championship cross country. Um, that was special for us here in the North. We actually also on the tennis side of things, I'm an old tennis parent and a tennis guy myself, um, so I know how rare this is. We actually had a boys single player from Bishop Minogue finish second in the state championship tennis tournament, individual tennis tournament this year, um, almost unheard of. And we actually had a Reno High School boys double team, doubles team finish second in, in the regional tournament or in the state tournament. So a couple of big celebrations there. We're really proud of those guys and, and to get past those first couple of matches in, in a state tournament. Um, against the quality of, of players that, that they have to play against um, from Southern Nevada is, is an accomplishment in itself. So congratulations to those guys. Um, again, the basketball official shortage has been an impact um, on everything we do, um, officials shortage across everything that we do, um, but we're experiencing basketball official shortages. We had to change our schedules completely um, Prior to the start of the season, we basically, where we would have um, upper levels at one site, lower levels at the opposite site, um, 
which makes everything real easy. Officials couldn't cover all of those games. That's six games on uh, at each site um, on a given night. So we had to move all of our lower level games to two different days of the week than we play the upper level games. So that has been, I'm sure Tim uh, is experiencing that in Southern Nevada as well, but we've fortunately been able to work real well with our um, officials commissioners and, and come up with solutions that um, uh, limit the amount of games and that have to be canceled or rescheduled. So hopefully we've taken the steps, steps necessary to make sure that um, our basketball season, both girls and boys and, and our wrestling seasons um, go off without a hitch. So um, with that, I'll open myself to any questions on the 5A if anybody has them. If not, I'll defer to Tim in the, in the South. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. Uh, class 4A, 5A7 radio. Uh, afternoon. I want to congratulate everyone in the uh, state championship realm for the entire state, not just the South. Uh, the fact that we played is, is a, a credit to our kids, our parents, our schools, and everybody in this room. So congratulations to all of them. I want to echo what Bob was just talking about in the North with the officials. And it's a very specific problem here as well in the South. Um, I would have to say that the schools have put up with quite a bit from our office uh, specifically with seven to 14 day windows to change the entire schedule many times due to a lack of communication from our officials association with us about the true nature of what they're facing. Um, the SNOA has continued the practice for the last three seasons of notifying us 14 days before the season begins that they cannot cover the current schedules that have been out in some cases over three months prior. We need that to be addressed. We need the SNOA to understand that they can't do this to schools every season. We cannot put out a schedule and they cannot tell us two weeks before the season starts that that schedule cannot be covered by them. They have a contract that requires us to submit to them our schedules uh, 60 days prior, which we are meeting and them coming back 14 days. Again, I said it three times now that they can't cover that schedule. Um, they are mandating that we use their officials association, but they don't have the officials to cover our games. Uh, seasonal games have been changed seasonally. Game limits have been reduced seasonally. Sports specific dates have been enacted to meet their needs, but the reverse has not been accommodating to our schools. Uh, our schools are now going on six day athletic schedules because we have no other option to, but to do that when they present the problem, we need them to help present a solution. And the solution cannot be, we don't have enough. We need them to set with us and come up with solutions that work. We also need the number to be conveyed to our schools earlier than the window that they're being conveyed to. But on a bigger note, after being told we couldn't cover this by their president, he then informs the middle school, which had not had any sports, that they were going to be provided coverage for their games at the same rate we're being covered at the high school, which leads us to believe there's some sort of communication fault here that needs to be addressed. Those referees should have been offered back to the high school first. If there was an increase in those officials, the high school should have been covered first. And I know my wall mates on the other side here and he's hearing this on delay and he's not gonna be happy, but I have to think of the high schools in Southern Nevada, all of them we could have used those 12 sets of officials when we were only given 15 sets for the entire varsity. So we need that communication to be better. We also need to understand that the increase needs to be reversed so that we can have those officials. We, we were the 11th of November, we were, they were taken away and less than a week later, they were given, given to the middle schools. We can't have that down here. It appears that the additional middle school basketball coverage and the appearance of middle school staff didn't matter to the high schools. Um, we need the SNOA to share factual and timely information with our groups. And if they cannot, we need to be given the ability to seek out other officials associations to cover our events if they're available and they meet the requirements set by the NIAA and CCSD and our charter and private school partners, because we cannot keep doing this to the schools two weeks before the season starts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. 
3A, Mr. Ray Parks. Sounds like a lot of that was already said. And as you know, in the north, we've had the same issues with some officials, with transportation, those kind of things. We've updated schedules left and right. Um, it's been a very difficult fall season. Um, we're looking forward to the winter. As you know, it started off a little goofy with Lyon County not testing kids at first, but now they have. So I think we're all on the same page. Uh, I'd like the board to know that we had to adjust our football playoff structure at the last second just because we couldn't do crossover games, primarily at first due to COVID, then to due to smoke issues, then due to transportation, so on. So we're hoping not to have to do that in our basketball and wrestling. But um, I think right now, as far as our 3A Northern League, we are all on the same page and have a great relationship with the 3A South, and I can hope that continues. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Starro, Bill, 2A. Thank you, Rollins. Bill Darrow, Class 2A. First, I want to start by I want to start by thanking Donnie and Jay and Bobby and Bart and Lori, those guys in the office up there. You know, as we navigate through all these waters and all the things that we've talked about so far, those guys are always there. They always return the calls or answer the phone and, you know, never ever have a problem with helping us with what we need. So I want to say thank you to the staff for, for always being there, especially to help me. And, you know, just echoing what everybody else says, we, we haven't had a whole lot of games canceled. We've had a few through the, the fall season with COVID, just but not a lot. And uh, we haven't had the, as big a problem with the officials as, as Tim was talking about. We've, we've, we've been lucky. I haven't been notified of any cancellations yet in basketball. So, so far, so good. With us, we're like Mike, though. We, we only use two at Needles, and some of our schools only use two just because, you know, when you, get, when you get into travel and things of that nature, it's just cost prohibitive to use three. But other than that, you know, the fall season went well for the two-way, and it's starting well in, in the winter season. So hopefully that keeps up and we don't see some of those officials' problems that, that are going on in, at the upper levels. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Class 1A, Mike Strong. Thank you, Mike Strong, uh, 1A rep. I might start by just some thank yous as well. And um, first off, I'd, I'd like to start off by thanking Boulder City and Reed High School, both for cross country and all the work that goes in to a cross country meet. I had not seen it before till this year. And it's an, a tremendous amount of work. And, and staff was out there as well, making it happen. And um, so, so thank those schools. Um, thank uh, Hug for hosting volleyball state um, as well for, for all the classifications and be willing, willing to do that and put on that event. We had uh, the four divisions play and we had Elko hosted with Wells um, participating with them to host for the East and Sarah Lutheran in the, in the um, West and Adelson in the South and Prentice Valley here in the central. And, and uh, to put those events on and help with travel. It kind of worked really well for us. I think um, Beatty did a double header for us in football which is a pretty cool event. And so appreciate their work, their work there. And, you know, in football also, you know, the one, one a obviously wasn't fortunate enough to be in Allegiant, but I can tell you this, uh, Donnie went to work right away to come up with the next best thing for us. And, and uh, I want to thank Grant and those guys at, at Gorman and Donnie for making that happen for a, a, a really good event at Gorman for the one, a state football championship um, you know, on a, on a Saturday down there. And so it was a, it was a pretty cool event and to be able to watch what happened in Allegiant that day, though, was pretty amazing for all those kids. So a lot of positive things happening, um, through all of this. And, and it's because as we sat in these zoom meetings, uh, geez, over the last year and a half or whatever it was, it was all about the kids, right. And making sure it was about the kids. And I've always said, if we can keep it about them, good things are going to happen for them. And so, Getting fall off and finished up was very, very cool um, to be able to make that happen. And hopefully winter goes better. And congratulate Smith Valley for a volleyball state championship this year and Frantic Valley on their football state championship. Um, just can't say enough. I'm like, Billy, I can't say enough for the NIAA staff. You know, people, you know, they may think that, uh, you know, we don't matter. We don't care. Some of these smaller classifications. And it's just it's just absolutely wrong. Because I, I know uh, people in the 4A and 5A and 3A, they're willing to jump in and help us make things happen. And, and so I want to thank you all and thank you for the, 
to the staff in particular for for um, all the work that you do on behalf of all the student athletes in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Private schools, Brett. Thank you, uh, Brett Walter, Faith Lutheran uh, for representing the private schools here. Uh, I don't really have any new issues uh, that specifically re relate to the private schools. All the private schools are parts, they're members of leagues and uh, the league liaisons do a great job of, you know, of, of uh, letting everybody know the, the issues that the leagues are facing, but no new issues right now as it relates specifically to private schools. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody as well. Uh, and uh, especially uh, here just recently, uh, Tim, Pam, their office and dealing with some of the hiccups here with the officials and uh, making some changes to the basketball schedules. Uh, you know, Tim is, you know, really the guy who came up with a couple solutions for us. And, uh, you know, I think uh, he, uh, he deserves some credit and deserves to be recognized for, you know, finding some solutions uh, to the shortage and, uh, and what we're going through. It really could, could have provided or could have caused uh, some, some major issues for us down here and cost kids chances to play and participate. So, I appreciate that, um, you know, and, and then a little, just a little feedback. We did host a, a 2A, 4A, 5A state uh, volleyball realignment committees getting back into full swing, which I'm a, a part of uh, sitting on that committee. Uh, they've done a great job. And uh, just the feedback that I would have, uh, you know, from the state volleyball tournament, it, it, the, the classifications that we have, it was great to watch, great to see the kids compete. Uh, probably nothing more special than the 4A. Uh, state championship that happened here and watching Rancho uh, win that and watching those kids uh, be a part of that. I think uh, the, the was a testimony to some of the things that have been done in realignment uh, to give those kids a chance to, to compete for a state championship. So, you know, just a little feedback, uh, you know, based on that and watching, uh, watching that happen. It was a, uh, it was really great for those kids. So I think appreciate everybody's work, you know, in the realignment process. And, and then here we go again with it uh, for, uh, for the next go around. So, uh, thanks a lot. Hey, this is Bob Northridge. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. I just want to, uh, hey, Brett, thank you again for hosting volleyball. My gosh, you guys stepped up and did a phenomenal job there at Faith Lutheran. It was a first class event. And I, and I want to personally thank you and Faith Lutheran and your staff too, Amy and all those other people that working for putting on a first class volleyball event. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. You. Good. Uh, charter schools, Mike. Mr. Kofer is not with us today. Okay. Sorry about that. We'll next time. Okay, Regina, you're up. And President Saw with uh, Ms. Quintero will be with us tomorrow. No, no, no. She, I'm here. Donnie, I'm she's here. here. Oh, I'm sorry, Regina. You made it. My apologies. <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. All, yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rollins. Um, I'd just like to say hello to everybody. It's nice to see everybody again, if it's only just your face. Um, I have a few informational items as far as uh, right now, we are in the planning stages of our state conference. We are gonna be back to meeting in person at the end of February. Um, and I'd like to thank Donnie and the NIAA, everybody that's uh, on that staff for helping us, you know, with that communication stuff with UNLV, which is, uh, we will be at the Thomas and Mack Center, along with the state basketball tournament once again. So uh, that seems to be working out well for us. And I'm looking forward to, again, being able to meet in person and see everybody and, uh, you know, provide a, provide a great conference again this year. As of right now, we do have Dr. Lee Green as our keynote speaker. And if anybody has been to the national conference, they know that he is the NIAAA's uh, lawyer, sports law uh, person. So he's gonna be a great, great help and a great speaker for us. So we look forward to seeing him. And um, so again, we're in the planning stages. We're just looking forward to offering a great conference uh, to everybody in the state of Nevada. Um, Along with our speakers and vendors and things like that, we will be offering a few leadership training classes. Uh, hopefully we can get more people to complete those, be, get their CAAs, CMAAs. And that's what we're looking forward to right now with that. Um, the second thing is that we are getting ready to attend the NIAAA National Athletic Director Conference at the end of this week. Um, so everybody, I think most people that are going to be in attendance will be leaving probably around Friday. 
And again, it's good to be able to meet in person uh, with colleagues from around the country. And again, maybe some leadership training, a lot of, a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, uh, communication with people around the, around the different states and what they're dealing with as far as athletic directorship and with COVID and things like that. But again, it's gonna be good to meet in person with people. Um, and we're looking forward to that. So I do have out uh, on my Remind 101 of, I, I usually have to send out a message board as far as any activities that NADA will be doing, as far as what meetings we're attending, um, what socials we're having, when and where, things like that. So if you're interested, I sent that out on our AMP final forms. If you would like that from me of how to, even if you're not in attendance at the, at the national conference and you wanna see what people are doing, you know, we have different people teaching classes, making presentations, attending meetings. So if you would like to have some of that information, feel free to join that Remind 101. Um, you can just email me at rrq941 at yahoo.com and I will send you that information and how to exactly join that class for me. Or I can even text it to you. That's the way you do it on your phone. And you can, you can see a lot of the things that does happen at the, the national conference and the people, the way that we are involved from the state of Nevada, which I think is, um, has been really great for us. Um, along those lines at the national conference, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Tim Jackson, who will be receiving the NIAAA Distinguished Service Award. Um, and I think that's a, that's a huge deal. And it's a great form of recognition you know, for, for anybody really, um, but also for us to have somebody from the state of Nevada that, that um, has stepped up and done a lot of that process and been involved uh, with committees and, and classes and conferences. Uh, so I, I think that's a huge plus for the state of Nevada that we have somebody that will be recognized again this year uh, by the, the national organization. And again, he's receiving the, the Distinguished Service Award from the NIAAA. You know, so we are, we're looking forward to getting kind of back in the routine of, of running things and providing information for all the athletic directors and athletic administrators. And uh, I think the final thing is that, you know, the more we can help you, the more, the, the better off we'll all be. And uh, if you need anything else, you know, my, my email is there. My phone number is there. Give me a call, send me a text, just let me know. And uh, hopefully we can all get together here soon and have a great time. Thank, Thank you. you. Eugene, appreciate that. It's exciting that this is uh, it's opening back up for us. I believe we've missed uh, Tampa. We've missed a couple Tampa, of years. Yeah. And uh, I think we missed another location as well. So it's going to be good to, to get back. And if not to the national convention, it would be good to get back down to uh, Vegas and get our, um, get our athletic directors from the state together again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nevada Fish Association, Ellen. All right, just a few liaison updates. Um, I've kind of heard from a few of the commissioner presidents, uh, one in for the spring regarding baseball. Numbers look fairly decent at this point in time for officials, but um, hard to say because it's still a few months out. You know, the number of officials working versus registered, that that kind of is a disparity when we look at some of those things, we get officials who register, but then don't end up working. And I know we've had cancellations and, you know, the reduction in fit in, in officials is causing numerous changes and movement on the schedule. And uh, I sympathize with Tim and any other athletic director that's having to put together schedules. Um, I know the numbers are still down in Southern Nevada, you know, affecting basketball and flag football and, I can say from my standpoint as a commissioner and an assigner for volleyball, it's very frustrating when I can't get officials to commit uh, because they don't want to commit two or three months before the season. For some reason, I don't know if this is just human nature that you have officials who just, they want to wait until, oh, just a couple weeks or three weeks before the season starts to kind of register. And, and that causes an issue for us to try to you know, figure out, do we have enough people to, to do these, these matches, these games? And so, you know, I think it, it, it's very frustrating. Um, 
I know I'm on a committee that Lori Lotz has put together, officials campaign to, you know, recruit and uh, retain officials and it, we're in its in our infancy. And so, you know, we're looking at all sorts of avenues on on how to address the shortage of officials because it's just not, you know, Nevada, it's not just statewide, it's all across the country. Um, so I, you know, I sympathize with not having enough officials. It's frustrating on my end as well. And anybody who does assigning and, 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 and running their organization. I know that um, the Southern Nevada officials president, Vince Christosik, he's met with um, officials at the College of Southern Nevada and trying to get some things through them. Uh, they're trying to propose some different resources available that would help bring new officials in and retain officials and basically kind of boost the officiating in Southern Nevada. But we know that this is not gonna happen overnight. That's gonna take a while to get that in place and um, you know, just recruiting and how do we get new officials? So that's an issue. Um, we've had a few getting payments from schools and school districts at least volleyball, we had some experience with about six different schools um, that we're still waiting to get money from. Uh, and our season ended about uh, four weeks ago for most of them. I think the SNOA experienced a little bit of a delay from Clark County. And um, another issue, I think we've touched on this a little bit. I know uh, um, it was touched on as far as you know our communications. We, we need a lot better communications between assigners, schools, et cetera, athletic directors. Sometimes you don't get a sufficient notice about a rescheduled match, at least from my end on a signing. You know, when I get the call the day of a game gonna be played in three hours and someone says, you probably don't have this on your schedule. You know, we do the best we can to, um, to supply those officials and, and get it done because we really want the kids to play. Um, let me see if I have anything else here from other associations. I think that that just about covers it for our group at this point. Thank you. Alan. Thank you. Oh. oh, and I have one last thing, Tim, congratulations on your award. Congratulations, Tim. Uh, Robin Starworth, up with the director of athletics at uh, the Washoe County School District. Uh, all I'd like to say is there's one thing that the pandemic has provided us with is an opportunity to show the power, strength, and, and organization uh, that we have as an NIAA in the state. And it's basically pushed us in the forefront with regards to leadership of athletics from 5A to, to 1A and to govern our, our, our people and to govern our party and, and to govern our, our athletics and coaches throughout the state. And I think that um, the pandemic has showed that uh, the governor's office, the superintendents, and all of the schools need this leadership from us and, and we'll continue to provide that. I appreciate all the work that you guys do from the uh, coaches up to the athletic directors at every school, through the athletic administrators, even involvement of the principals, the superintendents in supporting athletics and the NIAA. And I just want to kind of stress that because uh, as most of you know, the Washoe County School District has been deeply involved in the last week with the, with the NIAA with uh, regards to procedures and protocols. And I just want to assure you that when there is a guidance, a guideline, procedures and policies that are spread throughout the state from the NIAA office that Everyone's going to follow them to the fullest and, 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 and correctly. And there's not going to be any assumptions that someone is doing it any other way. And uh, I, I appreciate all the work that you do in guaranteeing that that happens uh, throughout the state. All right, Donnie, thank you. And that, in our mm -hmm. LA, Executive Director, Donnie Nelson. Yeah, thank, thank you, President Stallworth, for your, for your comments. And thank you, everybody else, well, for all your comments and work. As we all know, and we're all in agreement that the health, safety, and well-being of our student athletes is always the first priority. And providing rules fairness towards competition 
is also certainly paramount within the framework and, and all that we do. I, I want to extend a huge thank you, as many of you have already done so, to the levels of the principals, the administrators, the athletic directors, the secretaries, the coaches, the officials, and of course our student athletes for adhering to everything that was required of them to get through a challenging fall season. A, a lot of obstacles and we yet as a collective group accomplished some, some great things. Uh, I also truly hope that we can continue to provide the same assistance, cooperation, and support to all of each other as we navigate our way through hopefully what will be a safe and successful winter season. There, there are, there's still many, many challenges out there that we're all facing on our all different levels. Uh, but, you know, with that said, one of the advantages that I've been so fortunate to be in this association is that we're, we're a small state in terms of numbers of schools that we have, and therefore the personnel that we all work with. But that is exactly the advantage is that we all get to work with each other on a personal level, more so probably than any other state. And on a regular basis, you know, what, what our schools, and I use that just generally, what our schools accomplished during the fall season was absolutely awesome. And I'm not talking about just the preseason contest and the regular season contest, but to put it all together for the postseason for our region state tournaments, because we were at a lot of host sites. We had a lot of different schools step up to host that normally otherwise wouldn't have. And we had a lot of different schools step up to host other classifications as well. Uh, I, I'm very proud of what we all did. I also want to thank, of course, the staff uh, for the Las Vegas Raiders and Allegiant Stadium. Uh, talk about groups of people that stepped up absolutely big time to host all but one of our state football championship games. As, as we all know, we've all heard, you know, the state football championships at Allegiant happened very quickly. And to think that those staffs really took on stuff that was well beyond their normal job descriptions with what they do with the organization of the Raiders or with the facility of Legion Stadium. It just, you know, again, they went above and beyond their own call of duty to assist us, and it was a tremendous undertaking. With that said, you know, again, the 1A was only left off the dock at those state football games because of logistical reasons with UNLV hosting the next night. And I will tell you, uh, I had a lot of personal consternations about doing the games without the 1A because I knew right when we got down the final minute that that wasn't going to happen because of UNLB playing on a Friday night. Um, so we had to go on Thursday and the Raiders play on Sunday. We didn't have Saturday available to us. But, but I will make this promise to you as your interim executive director that in future discussions with the Raiders and Allegiant, and, and we're, we're going to get into those things, everybody, everybody will be included, including the 1A, and we will do it together. And we're going to be able to plan it out in advance to make sure it all works. And, and again, we want the Leafman Stadium staff, the Raiders and the NIA to be partners in all that. Last thing is again, uh, as you've all echoed, congratulations to Tim Jackson being a distinguished service award winner for the NIAAA is a major accomplishment. And I know many of you here, and many of you, uh, you know, in the meeting and listening, obviously what you've done through the NIAAA and your credentialing process to get through all the different degrees of RMA and CAA and CMMAA, CCMAA, uh, it's a lot of a lot of work on your part to do that. So again, to think about Tim following the line of some of the incredible administrators that we've had uh, in the past go through the same process. That's a big congratulations for that award. So that said, President Stallworth, I think that wraps us up on item number 19. And with that, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm actually going to jump right through item 20. Uh, I'm going to I'm just going to tell you about item 20. You know, this has basically become somewhat of a standing item lately for us because of all the things going on with regards to officials, lack of numbers, we've, we've talked about all that. Uh, I'm gonna tell you that this item doesn't need to return. We, we, we've already addressed it. It will not be a standing item anymore. We know the issues as we've talked about through our different reports, liaisons about working together, officials groups, and uh, our liaisons and leagues and regions and classification. So that's it, we'll, we'll skip over item number 20. Okay, okay good. Thank we'll you. go to item 21, NIAA partnership update. Uh, is Brady gonna join us? I believe Brady is on. Did you get into the room, Brady? Yeah, I'm on here. Here we go. It's all yours, uh, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, just a real quick. I'll be I'll be short, but uh, just to dovetail off what Donnie was talking about with the Raiders, uh, it was a really great event from a sponsorship side in terms of what we were able to do for all our partners with the exposure and the logo placement we had in the stadium. Uh, a bunch of I've sent everything out to all our partners showing what we did. Uh, and it's definitely a game changer for us in terms of uh, having the ability to do 
something on that scale when we put it in packages and stuff. So with that being said, it was, it was a great event. And uh, I want to thank the Raiders also. Uh, just a couple updates. Uh, E-Team sponsor came on board. Uh, they're going to be our official fundraising partner. They're based out of California. They joined all our Playfly states. Uh, great partner. Uh, we got them right on, on board right before the football championships. So we'll be sending stuff out <clears throat> to all the schools and our database and stuff, promoting them. Uh, but they will be our official fund, fundraised crowdfunding partner of the NIA. Dick's Sporting Goods came on board, which is great. Uh, actually, this week we'll be sending out an email blast. They're offering discounts to the NIA member schools and uh, stuff like that we'll do up throughout the year for them and they'll get some signage opportunities, but a great partner uh, joined us in New Mexico at the same time, which is good. And a company called Gipper uh, came on board. Uh, they're a company that helps create and share sports graphics on social media. They work with a lot of universities, school associations, stuff like that. So they're on board as well, but still trying to get people in and, and uh, different companies in for the winter and spring and things are looking really good there. So everything's looking up in the sponsorship world here at the NIA. So excited about that. But I just want to uh, thank Bob Northridge too for everything he does in the South with all the signage and everything he helps me with. It, I couldn't do it without him. So I just wanted to throw that out there, but thank you. Thank you, Brady, appreciate it. Uh, agenda item 22, Sportsmanship Committee update. Yeah, thank you, President Stallworth. Our committee met on October 25th. We are scheduled to meet again on January 18th. The minutes from the fall meeting uh, are in your packet there, pages 222 through 225. And really, you can read the member comments in there to see some of the potential directions that this committee is going to go. I, I, I love the makeup of this committee. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, aspects that people can contribute and really a lot of different directions that we have represented in this committee. So it, it's, a, it's a wonderful group. And we've got, a, honestly, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us in a lot of different ways. And again, you can read some of those comments that will help you guide you as to where, where this committee is headed with things and possibly taking some action here in the near future. So Mr. Stallworth, I think uh, to you as um, trying to think of any other comments to sportsmanship committee, anything that you might have, anything that Ms. Sloan Members, Vice President Sloan might have to this. Yeah. Yeah. We're just okay. looking forward to uh, to getting more information out and uh, keeping this being the forefront of, uh, of sportsmanship, not only for our student athletes, but for our spectators and everyone else involved in the contest as we move forward. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, number 23, the Realignment Committee update. I, again, <laughs> what, what a great group we have with regards to realignment. I'll tell you what, when you get to section meetings and national meetings, the one word that jumps out and scares everybody mindless is realignment. <laughs> we are, we're in a two-year process now on a regular basis. Uh, first official meeting of the realignment committee was conducted November 30th. The agenda is referenced on pages 227 through 229 in your packet. The committee adopted a timeline and policies uh, minus those outstanding for two sports, being swimming and diving and track and field. I think uh, we've got those minutes sent out. If not, they'll go out tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll double check, but they're ready to go. Uh, what we have not accomplished yet in the first phase of realignment is the adoption of procedures. And I call those the nuts and bolts of the process. So th those are coming. And those are when the real heavy questions come in, talking about rubric 3A, 4A, and 5A. Uh, talking about the North, 5A, 3A, 4A, <laughs> uh, the 1A and 2A and league structure and keeping the same possibly uh, or how things might be amended. So we've got a long way to go to the process and a short time to get there, but we've got a, a wonderful representation for our committee members. I, I want to thank Bart Davis from our staff. Did a fantastic job and really helping to provide the, the intimacy of all the things that we discussed in, in agenda. So thank, thank him for that. And Again, the, the committee that we have in place, it's a, it's a positive, it's a productive, and it's a valuable group uh, with what the input that they provide. So that's what I can say with realignment. Again, uh, President Stallworth, you serve as our chair. Vice President Sloan serves as our vice chair. Uh, I'll open it to either one of you if you have any initial comments based on our first meeting. Same comment. I think uh, Pam would agree that uh, the addition of, uh, of Bart South, as I call him, <laughs> uh, to the committee, uh, 
he's the only guy I know that can change numbers into words. And um, his ability to do that kind of helps, uh, helps explain a lot to, to, to some of us that have uh, dyslexia. So uh, with that being said, I, I appreciate his involvement and look forward as we continue to work on on realignment. I think one of the things that a lot of people focus on on realignment are some of the negative factors that are going on with it. And I like to look at it as what are some of the great positive things that are taking place with realignment. One thing I want to mention is uh, we moved uh, two soccer teams up that have been traditionally three A schools over the last couple of years. Uh, we moved them up to the to the five A. And both of those schools have won regional titles and have played for the state championship in Sparks High School and uh, Hug High School. So to me, those are the examples of some of the positive things that have taken place in real life, especially for the North, and uh, as, as we see. And our involvement with some of our 5A schools that went down to the 3A, I think that's going to be successful. I think they've been competitive. Um, even though they're a little bit larger in numbers, I think that it's been good for the 3A in the North and it's been good for, for, for those schools in Washington County. Um, and, and they've been somewhat competitive. They haven't won or dominated anything, but they've been competitive and played well. And I hope that's been a good addition to the 3A up North. That's yes. all I have. Oh. Pam? No, I just like to say I absolutely agree with Rollins. I think going in the direction of the five classifications has been extremely beneficial, especially for those of us in the in the south. The 4A has just been phenomenal. And uh, I'm glad that the committee chose to go in that direction um, as we continue on with the realignment. And I just want to thank everybody that was a part of that because we have some pretty strong conversations. And uh, I'm looking at Ray Parks right now. He's one. And uh, his, his passion for the 3A, and I respect that. So, so yeah, this has been a great committee. We'll get it done. Hey, hey thanks, Pam Rollins. Can I have one moment? Sure. I, I really want to thank the board today for, you know, the decisions they made to see that, you know, with the proposal for the soccer to let that ride. Because I really believe that we can work all this out, those of us that, that do this daily and bring them a solid package that they can vote on and we could really get to where these uh our hope is that the appeals come to the realignment committee prior that's our plan someday and that way when we go to the board we have a solid thing that we have all agreed on those of us that actually work in this daily so i appreciate the board today thank you thank you Ray. all right I can go to item number 24, Mr. President. Number 24, the 23 24 NIAA Master Schedule Activity Calendar. Donna. All right, team. If we go to page 231, again, this is not for action today. This is for information and discussion. On 231 is the Master Activities Calendar, which at this time is to be proposed in the spring meeting for 23 24. And then behind that, pages 232 through 233 are the kind of the breakdown of sites. Uh, one thing I will note to you on page 233, uh, I think you, hopefully you all received the email from me with the amended copy. Uh, for those that are listening or seeing online, otherwise the dates that I have for the spring tournaments were uh, not correct. And the 21-22 is really meant to be 23-24. And so those dates are not correct with regards to the individual sports as well. But we'll, we'll get that, obviously it's corrected now and we'll get it prepared. Here's what I want to tell you about being for information or discussion is that because there is, there is the possibility of our state football championships being a proposal to be combined annually at Allegiant Stadium. I'm not saying we're there yet. That's got to come through the, the Las Vegas Raiders. It's got to come through the Allegiant Stadium staff. Uh, and then also, certainly it's got to come to the board about do we really take one sport and play all the state championship games in probably a two-day period at one venue, which is clearly in one end of the state. So uh, not going to get past judgment on that. That proposal doesn't exist yet. But if that were to happen, how would other things be affected, you know, sport by sport and keeping rotations if one sport has a central site as the designated site for a period of years? So anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that later. A second part of that is also looking to, on a personal level, looking to reunify the athletic directors conference, uh, our NADA conference, 
either with basketball or with football. And again, depending on what action may be with the master calendar, if we do get the opportunity to have football uh, together, everybody, 1A through 5A, and we get a set period of years for that, and if that happens and it's approved at the board level, having the option for the State Athletic Directors Conference to be associated with that event in the fall would be tremendous. Uh, if not, uh, another option is about to look to reunifying the state basketball tournament. I, I really believe that our Athletic Directors Conference can be as successful as possible if it's tied into a hook for one of our tournaments. And in the past, up until this, this first year coming up, the State Athletic Directors Conference has been over, gosh, I guess over the last 24 years, 25 years, has been associated with the state basketball tournament. Um, I, I know the committee, the NADA committee has looked about, you know, planning it to be a standalone event and trying to figure what kind of attendance would happen, where do you do it, when do you do it? And so really the NADA planning committee is kind of stuck in a transition year, I say this year, because of what our action was to have sports state championships split up between classifications between North and South. And that was, again, to help save district travel budgets. There's certainly some validity to doing that. But I, I, we don't want to lose the conference and the value of it if we can't get everybody together or at least have that opportunity for everybody to get together in one place at one time. So we'll see how we have it plays out with state football or maybe relating back to state basketball. Uh, with that said, again, you, you can just review this. We'll get it corrected, and we'll get the, the Master Activities Calendar back in our spring meeting for approval. And hopefully by then, we'll know more from the Raiders or State Basketball, wherever we're going to go. With it. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. We will know more then. Hey, Donnie, I have a quick question. How, um, how are you going about tying in girls wrestling? Yeah, ooh, great question. And you will see that coming up in the agenda planning. And, uh, I'll mention that here in just a minute. Okay. So, State wrestling, I, I'll get, let me just say where we are with, uh, because it does go to the master calendar, right? It, it, we're still in compliance with the agenda item. This year, state wrestling is a invitational event. It is not a sanctioned championship sport, right? We all know that. It is a, an emerging sport. We didn't quite use that word emerging, but that's what's used nationally. So I'm talking about girls. I'm, yes, sorry to clarify. I am talking about girls wrestling. Thank you, thank you Mr. Anderson. And to, to answer Pam's question, I, I, she was talking about girls wrestling. So we have a championship invitational scheduled for February 4th and 5th or February 4th. I, I'm, it's, right, it's right there. And it is scheduled prior to the region tournaments, which is co-ed or open as a sport of wrestling. And of course, prior to the state championship weekend. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because of two things. One is, again, it's not a state to state championship sport. However, on February 4th, 5th, during that state girls invitation, we are gonna offer medals. We are gonna offer a team plaque. And the whole goal this year is to see what kind of participation we have in girls wrestling to see if it is a verifiable sport to get state championship sanctioned. By having the girls invitational this year, Prior to the region tournaments, it allows the girls to have their own event, but then still have the ability to go on and compete in the co-ed region or the state qualifying series. So I think we've got it structured exactly like we want to. Once we get through this winter season, I will be bringing back to you in the spring uh, some, some numbers, some data, and to see if we can't get to that point where we want to sanction girls wrestling as a state championship sport sooner than later. Is that a year away? Is it two years away? I'm not sure. So ho hopefully, uh, Vice President Sloan, that answered your question, which will then lead us into number 25. And one of the things you see in there, uh, to the second to last penultimate bullet point there on item number 25 is the determining of new weight classes for wrestling. What I'm going to do starting in January is take a survey of all for all of our schools, and it'll be the responsibility of the, the coaches to submit an answer through their athletic administrator and director about the NFHS requiring us to adopt either 12, 13, or 14 weight classes for wrestling, it can be effective as soon as next year, uh, or it has to go into effect by the 23-24 season. Along those same lines with girls wrestling, I'm also going to survey the coaches and the administrators about the same thing, 12, 13, or 14 weight classes for girls wrestling. So that way, if we do have girls wrestling approved sooner than later 
we know number number one what year girls wrestling will start so we can all look forward to that number two how many weight classes we will have in advance for girls wrestling as it relates possibly to boys wrestling being a separate sport and uh and then that will also lead us back to the master calendar to mean that we will not have at some point if we do adopt girls wrestling as a sanctioned champion sport we won't have a girl state invitation we will have girls wrestling have its very own state championship series all the way through, just like boys wrestling, it would then be, it's clarified as boys wrestling. So Ms. Sloan, did that uh, lead us in the right direction answering your question? Absolutely, great lead in. Thank you. With other regards to agenda planning and items for future meetings, you know, one thing that Mr. Anderson has done in the past as uh, we've conducted a board orientation or training session for a variety of reasons, we just haven't done that. And this is something that Mr. Anderson usually spends about 30 minutes on, he's got a, a sheet of highlights about what the roles, responsibilities of board members uh, are, and we'll do that. And maybe that's what we do in the springtime. We're a little past due, obviously, with, with our with the new members we have, but we want to do that. Uh, let's see. We want to – now that we've got the academic regulation passed and ready to go back to the LCB and get back to us with full implementation – the other main topic is we want to have our rules committee get back together and discuss transfer. And again, as you, I think many of you know, I did a survey uh, with regard to transfer and oh, initial enrollment or a one-time transfer or 180 days and, you know, what about six weeks and all kinds of things. Uh, again, that, I'm going to prepare that for uh, moving ahead in the springtime, but we want to get a rules committee back together to reevaluate re our transfer rules. That, that, will be, that will be a major process. Uh, we already talked about uh, name, image, and likeness uh, and coming back in a meeting that I hopefully look at January 26th, right? Weight classes. And, oh, last one. Uh, evaluating the merits of adding a shot clock in basketball. So the National Federation, uh, our, our governing body, has asked each state, if possible and if able to do it, would we conduct some kind of in-season survey to find out about the merits of a shot clock? You know, does it increase scoring? Does it decrease scoring? Does it, what does it do? Um, what kind of data can we find? We are very thankful in that we have a gigantic tournament coming up here, the Tarkanian Classic, and the directors of that event have been most gracious to take that on as our experimental tournament. Uh, we've given them permission to run shot clocks. It will not be in every single game because it is a massive tournament, but uh, they're going to run shot clocks in as many games as are feasible, and we're going to get data back. You know, what, what, what does that do? The scoring or discrepancy in wins, losses, and uh, meaning final scores? I don't know. Not sure what we'll find out of it. But at that point, we will re we report that back to the National Federation, our findings for all our events. And I can tell you that the National Federation Basketball Rules Committee has that right at the top of their agenda uh, about a shot clock. You know, is it be optional or even mandated through the rules? Uh, we, we're not going to talk about costs for districts or implementation of equipment or, or costs for extra officials. We're not going to get any of that yet. That, that's still down the road. But uh, one step at a time is for those states, and there are many of us, obviously, that have a representation on the National uh, Federation Basketball Rules Committee. And that's because by the rule book, we don't use a shot clock. So we'll find out. Mr. Stallworth, uh, that, is, that is all I have for agenda finding that in 10 to 25. Is there anything hey. I maybe should ask if there's anything else that needs to go on? Yes, we need to add the workshop for the new... Um membership for the, our board of control with the parents yes, yes. and students. Right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Lawson. That is, that's going to be part of that. Um, that's part of that, that January 26th meeting, right? It's, it's the amateur rules and also, again, the workshop being for our board composition. Correct. Thank you. Hey, Donnie, this is Pam. I'd also like us to go back and have a conversation about the official shortage. I'd also like, I, I see the contract for, and I'm speaking on behalf of the, the contract we have down here at SNOA, that I know the contract concludes July 1st, 22. So that's this summer, um, next summer. Um, I, I think with, with what we have been up against that maybe we need to, I don't know, amend the contract to give districts uh, the opportunity when, when there is a, an official shortage that we are able to seek outside groups because I know right now um, SNOA is it in the South. And uh, what we've had to uh, endure is, is it's rough. It's, it's extremely rough. Thank, thank you, Pam, for your comments. And I will certainly involve 
uh, Jay from our office and NL and being officials liaison in that. So I've got that noted that we want to have a conversation about the official shortage and the, uh, at least evaluating or looking at to amend the, the contract to allow districts the opportunity to seek outside groups. Okay. Yeah. And what that involves requires and yeah. Okay. Thank I, you. I, I want to bring something up. I don't know if this is an NIAA issue or more of a district issue uh, within the state, but um, are any districts out there, uh, athletic departments receiving any additional grant money, uh, COVID 19 money for their athletic departments for implementing all of these COVID testing things on their campuses and adding workloads to the athletic departments at every school? Um, have there any, has, has anyone approached you about funds that are available or have provided you information on possible funds available from the federal government uh, with regards to additional job responsibilities related to COVID-19 testing? That's a great question. <laughs> hey, Rollins. Yeah, I might be a little careful with that one, Rollins. I'm not sure. Yeah, right. So we've we've received you know that Esther's grant money and COVID relief money and and if it's administrative costs we've been able to roll some of that into it. You know I'm also the president of our Boys and Girls Club here in town, so we've been able to use that same type of funding for administrative costs. And we've checked, you know, Boys and Girls Club of America checked, and that was legal. And our district is checking on administrative costs as well. Of course, we're only 3,200 kids, so we're not receiving massive amounts but it has been allowed to be used for administrative costs okay thank you ray i just wanted to get a flavor of what's going on i know i attended a COVID 19 meeting um, and it was mentioned that there were some possibilities of some funds being uh, distributed based on work specifically related to COVID 19 and i know as well as you guys all of you are working that uh, the COVID 19 testing and uh, getting kids tested and athletes ready for go, that has changed the workload of all athletic directors, athletic departments on every high school campus here in our district. And I'm sure it's impacted your workload of your schools as well in our athletic department. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. If I find anything else out there, I'll send that to you and I'll get that information to you, Pam, if something comes up. Thank you. Um, let's go, 26? Yeah, let's go to public comments. Wow. 26, public comments. This time provides an opportunity for citizens to address the board about the matter, any matter not listed on the agenda item raised during the portion of the agenda. Cannot be deliberated or acted upon until compliance with notice procedures that the open meeting law has been accomplished. Members of the public who wish to speak on a matter not listed on the agenda we're instructed to contact Lower Lodge prior to the meeting to obtain a procedure for providing live public comment. Additionally, members of the public who have submitted public comment by email will have their email read into the record. The limit of three minutes per person and or five minutes for spokesperson of a group may be imposed. It is requested that comments be directed to the board as a whole. Comments that are determined to be irrelevant, repetitious, offensive, Inflammatory, willfully disruptive, or deemed to be personal attacks will not be permitted. The time limit and restrictions just described will apply to email comments being read into the record as well as live comments. Um, Lori, are there any additional public comments? No, I have not received any Has for any live location? or by email. Okay, good. Has any location in our Zoom room uh, received any or have any public comments? We do not have any public in attendance here at the hosting site. Thank you very much. That means we get to jump to agenda item number 27. I'd like to thank you guys very much for your participation today, as always, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. Wait. Oh, never mind. Never mind. What?